group of 27 mental health experts published this book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. In it, they warned that Trump's behavior shows him to be dangerously unstable, describing him as a pathological narcissist who's delusional, suffers from paranoid ideation, lacks conscience and empathy, and exhibits a host of destructive and dangerous psychiatric symptoms. Yeah, it's rough. Two months after its publishing, the book's editor met with 12 U.S. senators to talk about Trump's mental fitness. That editor's name? It's Dr. Bandy Lee. I am a forensic psychiatrist at Yale School of Medicine and an internationally recognized expert on violence. Since the book came out, Dr. Lee has become kind of the face of mental health experts warning about Trump. We express our consensus view that Mr. Trump is a danger to national and international security. Some of the psychological signs are impulsivity, recklessness, paranoid reactions, having a loose grip on reality, lacking empathy, having rage reactions. All of these are highly associated with violence. This week's chaos in the Trump administration is by now unsurprising and was in effect predicted by the new book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President, edited by Mandy Lee, MD, a psychiatrist. The book includes and validates some of the general news media's speculation about Donald Trump's mental capacity. He is emotionally driven, not obviously intellectually driven. You don't even want to use that word with regard to Trump. And I absolutely believe that uh, any decision he makes is going to be primarily influenced by the intensity of the emotion he happens to be feeling at that moment feeling about the person he's dealing with, whether he likes that person or not. You know, it isn't about liking the person because Donald Trump doesn't like people. Mm -hmm. uh, what he does is he sees them as useful or not useful, and he sees them as uh, s mirroring him and supporting him or opposing him and diminishing him. I want to go to just uh, Henry Friedman, associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, on the role of Donald Trump's cabinet relevant to this week's uh, Tillerson story. Uh, he says, a paranoid, hypersensitive, grandiose, ill-informed leader such as Donald Trump, who has surrounded himself with a cabinet and set of advisors who either are unable to bring him out of his paranoid suspicions and insistencies, or worse, identify with his positions represents a multi-dimensional threat to our country and the world. And, and Dr. Lee, when a psychiatrist sees this that way, that's the definition of the duty to warn. Exactly. Uh, the Goldwater Rule itself, which is the ethical guideline not to diagnose a public figure uh, uh, in the open, uh, falls under the ethical principle that we participate in activities that promote public health and public mental health. And so when, it, it, when silence uh, contributes to harm to the public health, then uh, we do have a duty to speak out and the duty to warn and the duty to protect. As far back as July 16, I was saying, uh, made me think that he could, in an impulsive, angry moment, uh, you know, punch in the nuclear codes with nobody between him and our destruction. Dr. Bandy Lee and Tony Schwartz, thank you very much for joining us. The book is The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, and this is an historic work in the history of American psychiatry. A bill on Capitol Hill that could start a formal process to evaluate any president's mental fitness is getting more interest with 56 co-sponsors, all Democrats. The Democrat who introduced the bill joins me now, Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland. Congressman, thanks so much for being here. Uh, you and several of your Democratic House colleagues met with a psychiatry professor from Yale, Dr. Bandy Lee. She told CNN today, quote, as the president is unraveling, he seems to be losing his grip on reality and reverting to conspiracy theories. There are signs that he is going into attack mode when he is under stress. That means he has the potential to become impulsive and very volatile, unquote. Uh, did she say that to the assembled Congress people? Well, I think that uh, Dr. Lee and other psychiatrists who've been up to meet with members of Congress have been predicting uh, increasingly delusional and paranoid behavior on the part of the president. Um, of course, we're not mental health professionals, we're not psychiatrists, that's not our role, but we do have a very defined and important role under the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, which is to set up a body 
that could act with the vice president in the event of an emergency when the president becomes unable for mental or physical reasons to successfully discharge the powers and duties of office. Sure, so but- the bill just sets up the body that would be able to go to work if there were a real crisis. But I guess one of the concerns would be a lot of these mental health experts, and we've seen them weighing in uh, in the New York Times and and on cable TV and elsewhere, um, there was something set up uh, in the mental health community called the Goldwater Rule, uh, deeming it unethical for for any mental health professional to give a professional opinion on a public figure who he or she did not personally evaluate. How could she say such a thing without examining the president? Well, they're not violating the Goldwater Rule, which is incorporated into a lot of state bodies of law governing mental health practitioners, because they're not making a specific diagnosis under the DSM of the president. As I understand what they're doing, they're acting the way that any citizen has a right to act under the First Amendment to say that they think that the president is dangerous and unable to successfully meet the powers and duties of office. And that's the constitutional standard. Well, that's a terrible lack of empathy. It shows, as in the most recent instance in Puerto Rico, a, a complete incapacity to feel what they're feeling and to protect them in the way that our government is supposed to. Let me add one more. How about the inability to ever admit you were wrong, even if you have changed a position? What does that indicate? Well, profound denial, a rigidity, a kind of preference for one's self-importance and delusions of uh, one's perfection over the reality. You know, on the radio, uh, many of our callers uh, ask the question or posit the notion that Donald Trump is mentally ill. You assert that that's not the right question. That's not Uh, the relevant. Why is that not the right question? Well, there are a number of reasons. One... Being mentally ill is not a disqualification mm-hmm. for, for high office. Just think about Abraham Lincoln and Winston from Churchill. Depression. Exactly. Great leaders. Second of all, having a mental illness isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about functional impairment. Somebody who can't process information, who can't make subtle, nuanced discriminations, who can't consult other people, but who gets overwhelmed by his own personal insecurity and urgency and has to lash out impulsively and vindictively. Are you just describing the president in those last couple of sentences? I'm describing my experience of the president, yeah. Yeah. As an expert on violence, I can tell you that uh, previous violence um, shows an indication for possible future violence, and he has already shown verbal aggressiveness, uh, history of sexual assault, incitement to violence at his rallies, uh, endorsement of violence in public speeches, and he's shown an attraction to violence and powerful weapons, as well as he has taunted hostile nations with nuclear power. All these things are signs of danger. It's really an unprecedented event that, that such a large number of mental health professionals have come forth uh, about their concerns about any president. The the group that you're a part of, uh, the psychiatric group, you're a contributor to a book called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. What are some of the key concerns uh, about Trump that you and your colleagues raise? Well, uh, I wrote a letter together, together with Judith Herman to the New York Times in which we raised two issues. One was his relation to reality, which is... Uh, I would say solipsistic and un, uh, untenable uh, and very dangerous to everyone. What do you mean solipsistic? Solipsistic with, from within the self. In other words, he only sees the world from within his sense of self. He can't have empathy for others. He can't really think into the future the consequences of his actions because he's totally preoccupied with the immediate event and how he can deal with it or manipulate it as emerging through uh, the perception on the part of his sense of self. That's very extreme. Uh, People who are psychotic behave that way, and yet for the most part Trump is not psychotic. Uh, That combination makes him really dangerous. CNN political analyst Carl Bernstein, the Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist who helped break the Watergate story, is here with me. It is so good to have you back. Be with you. Um, Just even listening to the vice president struggling 
struggling there, right, in responding to what the president had said last week, uh, the president up tonight, um, you know, in the midst of this credibility crisis. What do you think? His whole presidency is a credibility crisis because he traffics in misinformation, lying, and disinformation. And that is the hallmark of this presidency. And it's increasingly why Republicans, not just Democrats, are losing confidence in the president of the United States and wonder how long this kind of lying can go on to the American people. There's never been anything like this. He has flirted recently publicly about declaring a national emergency. Uh, do you think he goes there tonight? I, I wouldn't predict anything Donald Trump does or doesn't do, but I think we need to identify the real national emergency in this country, and that is the question of the uh, of whether or not Donald Trump is fit to be the president of the United States. And increasingly, we are hearing from Republicans, Democrats, journalists, citizens, on the basis of real hard information, why it may be that a consensus is developing that Donald Trump is unfit to be president of the United States because of his uh, actions in obstructing justice, because of what we just saw in Syria, because of his ignorance on foreign policy, because of his putting his self-interest and that of his family ahead of the national interest. But above all, the lying. This is, we've never been confronted with this kind of consistent dishonesty. Nixon was a criminal president. We've never been confronted with this kind of consistent dishonesty in terms of the president projecting a public debate that is based from the beginning of his presidency through today. Look indeed what he's tried to do, the, the pretzel he got himself into trying to explain the Russians in Afghanistan mm -hmm. with no understanding of the history of his own time and hasn't bothered to do the work. That's one reason that Mattis, Mattis Tillerson and others came to the conclusion that we have a national emergency. The national emergency is not the wall, it's Donald Trump. At times of tragedy, people look to their leaders. Uh, we've actually, we've obviously looked at the president's reaction to the man sending the pipe bombs, to the attack in the synagogue. What is your take on all of this? Uh, most presidents in a moment of crisis like this, especially with such a huge emotional element, you know, most of us are hurting. They heal, they unite, they inspire. You know, it's not exactly rocket science. You look all the way through American history, that's what pro presidents do. It's not in Donald Trump's software to do this. He's a one-trick pony. His, his single political MO is to try to divide and conquer, to pit groups against one another and benefit from it politically, even after a tragedy like what happened on Saturday. What other president in our history, Stephanie, would have made those jokes he did about his hair, would have gone on with this political rally just an, a few hours after this happened. It gets to empathy. You know, one of the things that we ask from a president is to have a little bit of empathy. When Abraham Lincoln was waging the Civil War, you know, he said to a friend, can you imagine that I, who cannot even bear to watch a chicken being slaughtered, I'm responsible for oceans of blood? Lincoln said when he was asked to build a national cemetery, he said, I'd put it near my summer house so that I will see it every single day so that I'll be confronted by those graves being dug and I will remember the results of the terrible decisions I'm making. Wow, there are people who are questioning whether the president's rhetoric, the division that he has caused, could be partially to blame to incite this kind of violence. A Washington Post reporter writes, the fact that Trump's rhetoric is without compare in American politics makes that a logical question. He's been doing it, it's been right before our eyes. You know, we all saw that rally when he was inciting people, you know, in the arena during the campaign to violence he's done it all the way through. You do not throw matches on kerosene if you're the kind of president that we were lucky enough to have for most of America. He history. also knows the white nationalist movement. So he could have used many other words besides a nationalist. To a lot of people, the word nationalist means white nationalist. Uh, in history, oftentimes, there was a man named George Lincoln Rockwell who was the head of the American Nazi Party who was killed in the 1960s and Rockwell wrote a book called The Nationalist Perspective and guess what he was referring to? 
president is not uh, uh, well at all mentally. Uh, I, I think he's, he's an extreme narcissist. He has been denied uh, what he wants, his wall, and uh, he is having a hissy fit. He's, he's, going, he's out of control, and uh, he uh, will not take no for an answer. It was clear to my fellow doctors and to fellow scientists and to just concerned people that there was something seriously the matter. I'm concerned about many things about his mental instability, but especially in the immediate present, I'm most worried about his unfettered authority to launch nuclear weapons. We also can understand psychopathology, uh, this idea of a feeling that one has the right to do whatever they desire to do. We also see the idea of talking about obsession and compulsive uh, behavior being played out. There are people who lie all the time and don't know it. Confabulation is when someone tells you something that's absolutely wrong and they firmly believe it to be true. This happens a lot with people with neurologic disease. When you see someone who lies all the time, you say, what could be wrong with that person? Is this a personality problem? Or is this a brain problem? Is it getting worse? We feel generally that there should be a more extensive kind of examination of American presidents or potential American presidents, and especially in relationship to their potential response to an extreme crisis such as nuclear threat. Trump has his finger on the triggers of three or four thousand nuclear weapons. Um, it's clear that if he even took one step in that direction, he could turn the world wars and the genocides of the 20th century into minor footnotes in the history of human violence. We, we can see a level of violent destructiveness on this earth that we've never seen before. Good afternoon. Welcome to our conference event by the title, The Dangerous State of the World and the Need for Fit Leadership, sponsored by the World Mental Health Coalition, an educational public service organization. My name is Dr. Bandy Lee. I am the editor of The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President a public service book of special knowledge that arose out of medical need. Special knowledge can bring clarity and power, and that is why we are here. We have gathered in an unprecedented way to bring together some of the nation's best minds across multiple disciplines in conversation. As a mental health professional, I am responsible for two types of psychiatry clinical psychiatry and preventive psychiatry. Clinical psychiatry deals with individuals, but preventive psychiatry as a branch of public health deals with the mental health of whole populations. Society is our patient, and we are responsible for its well-being according to our code of ethics. Public health requires multi-sectoral collaboration. We Americans are facing unprecedented dangers to our nation, to our constitutional system of informed checks and balances, and to the very fabric of our society. The psychological dangerousness in our president has now translated into social, cultural, and geopolitical dangerousness. Unless we address it for the societal pathology that it is, the problem will soon become uncontainable. Correct assessment at this critical juncture is the first step toward an informed and effective solution. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists, and I now turn this over to Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you very much. Uh, I am 
very pleased to be here to support uh, the work of the uh, World Mental Health Coalition and uh, Professor Lee. I am not a mental health uh, professional. I am uh, a scared American citizen uh, with uh, considerable uh, experience internationally and uh, almost daily experience of the Trump reality around the world. Uh, this is a very dangerous world, and uh, President Trump is making it a lot more dangerous. Uh, for those of us who are not mental health professionals but rely on uh, the uh, uh, analyses uh, in this book and the uh, analytical viewpoint, uh, what we have been told is alarming and extraordinarily important and not understood by the broad public uh, yet, uh, certainly not taken seriously by the uh, political class in this country at all, uh, and not really understood by uh, the pundits uh, who translate uh, daily events uh, into our news columns. This is taken as politics. This is taken as playing to a base. Uh, this is taken as uh, games, but what we are experiencing in the Trump era is something vastly more dangerous. Uh, we are experiencing uh, the most unstable, impulsive uh, holder of the presidency in our history uh, at a time of uh, grave international risk. There is not a place in the world that does not understand uh, these dangers. I travel all the time, there is a complete collapse of any confidence in American leadership right now. Uh, I've never experienced anything like it. I am in dozens of countries uh, in a year. Nobody has confidence uh, in Mr. Trump, in his mental stability, uh, in his capacity to uh, uh, make the world safer. Uh, in his ability to be a counterpart of international policy or to find ways to negotiate or maintain the peace. Uh, this complete collapse of uh, confidence in the American leadership is evident in countless surveys, including recent uh, Pew uh, surveys. There is no doubt that uh, Trump is inciting hate and violence all over the world. We've just experienced uh, another uh, dreadful attack that is part of the milieu that Trump is uh, uh, almost uniquely uh, creating right now. Uh, and we see it in our own country. We see it around the world. He is siding with the vicious dictators we know, uh, seemingly unable to distinguish murder from normal behavior, uh, and this in itself is a more incitement to violence uh, around the world. He does not keep Americans safe in any way from disaster, and when thousands died uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria on his watch and detailed epidemiological studies in uh, Puerto Rico showed how many thousands uh, had perished in the hurricane and its aftermath. He uh, simply flippantly denied the facts. This is an extraordinarily dangerous situation when Americans by the thousands die uh, and uh, the President of the United States is uh, completely uh, unable to process that information gives no care to that information, uh, flippantly denies that, and of course has no systematic relationship to evidence or the truth on almost any uh, event uh, in uh, any uh, capacity that we are seeing. Uh, of course, uh, if we turn to policy issues, uh, such as the recklessness of his environmental policies, this is putting the whole world at peril. But we're talking about something more than policy debate here. 
we're talking about the profound danger of a mentally unstable individual who holds the highest office uh, in this country and uh, the most powerful single office uh, in the entire world. There are multiple threats of war that uh, such an impulsive uh, person could well bring about. Uh, his policies uh, are deliberately right now uh, uh, having the effect of uh, denying food and medicine to the people of Venezuela. That's not a mere policy issue. That is uh, a, a deliberate, uh, massive infliction of harm uh, on uh, millions of people, knowingly and uncaringly and unreflectively, uh, in some kind of uh, bravado. And of course, we have now reached uh, the point where we are being ruled by decree. Uh, and uh, if this emergency decree stands, one can expect that we will uh, proceed to more and more emergency decrees. In other words, the situation is uh, unique in our history, uh, uniquely dangerous. We need the advice and counsel of the mental health professionals to understand this because we are not dealing with politics in this case. We are dealing with mental health issues uh, and uh, we need to understand better the dangers. And that's why I really want to applaud the mental health professionals uh, that are with us. Uh, they have uh, spoken out despite uh, lots of pressure uh, that uh, is on them. They have been very brave and forthright, accurately uh, assessing their professional responsibility to explain to the public the realities uh, that we are facing. We have an excellent panel ahead, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. I want to thank everybody for being here at this very important occasion. Thank you. Next is Mr. David K. Johnston. Yes. David, can you hear us? But we don't hear you. While we are fixing the technical problem, next is attorney Richard Painter. Okay. Thank you. I'm Richard Painter. I'm a member of the New York Bar, but I am uh, teaching at the University of Minnesota. I'm also a scared American. I'm scared for my family. I'll mention three family members that come to mind. One, my grandfather, who's long since passed, Sidney Homer Jr., who was a bond market economist and bond dealer in New York in the 1930s and 40s, and who uh, was very concerned about what was going on in Germany. And uh, he, he went around raising the alarm 
when many people in New York were busy stuffing their pockets on business deals in Germany, uh, figuring out how much money they could make, investing in companies over there, and then when Hitler took over, focusing only on protecting their investments. Uh, how can we make sure and recover on our bonds? Uh, that's what's important. No, my grandfather was scared. Scared for the future of our country. And then Europe went to war, and my grandfather was urging that the United States come in on the side of Great Britain, and a group called America First said no. A group that was bankrolled. Much of the money coming from powerful business interests who had investments in Germany and didn't want the United States to get involved in that war. And we should have learned our lesson from what happened then. Even the New York Times, the greatest newspaper in America then, and I think still today, failed miserably to cover what was going on in Germany in the 30s on into the 40s throughout the war. People weren't willing to stand up and say what they thought. There is a duty, a duty to warn, a duty to protect, not just a duty to focus on your own economic interests. And I'm glad my grandfather did that. He didn't make money on Wall Street, but he stood up for his country. I think of my wife as a music historian, Karen Painter, and uh, she does a lot of work on what happened in Germany in the 30s and uh, the 40s. And uh, a Trump speech comes on. Uh, and she's sitting there at her computer and takes a look at it. And she's scared. And I'm scared. I know those analogies some people say are too well-worn and that we, we shouldn't try to draw comparisons between what Donald Trump is saying and what a dictator could do without the protections that we have built into our Constitution. But it is a very dangerous situation, particularly if we do not use the protections that are built into our Constitution in the 25th Amendment of the Constitution and the impeachment clause in the Constitution. We have an obligation, a duty to warn, a duty to protect. And I think of my three children and the fact that this president could obliterate human civilization, kill me, my wife, my children, my friends, everyone in this room in 20 minutes because he has control of the weaponry to do that. And it is for that reason that we have the 25th Amendment of the Constitution that was adopted in the 1960s to respond to the grave threat to our country if a psychologically imbalanced individual who was incapable of serving as President of the United States were to be in the White House and in control of nuclear weapons. There's a duty to warn, a duty to protect. And the psychiatrists and the psychologists who have the courage to step forward and say what they think are protecting our country and human civilization. And never should you allow your profession to tell you you need to keep your mouth shut. How many people were told to keep their mouth shut in Germany in the 1930s? And where did they end up? Where did our civilization end up? Your profession should never be able to tell you not to speak your mind. We need psychiatrists, we need psychologists to say what they think and take that Goldwater rule and throw it away. It is a violation of your First Amendment rights and a violation of your duty to your country and to human civilization. Say what you think. We need you. I can't go on CNN and speak as an expert on the mental health of the President of the United States. I can look at his Twitter feed and say, hey, he looks like he's nuts. But that's about all I can do. And that I'm scared, and I'm scared for my children, my family, and for all of you. But I need your help. You need a lot less of me on CNN and MSNBC and a lot more of you if you are a mental health professional. And I want to see you there. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't speak out. It's your duty. Thank you.
Next is Dr. Ruth Ben Giet. There's, there's a, a, a siren. This is appropriate, I suppose, for our, uh, our, uh, our dire situation. In January 2016, I happened to see a video of President Donald, presidential candidate Donald Trump at a rally. I saw him rouse the crowd in, to perform a loyalty oath, his face smug, his voice hard and metallic, barely concealing the condescension he had for those in front of him. I heard him joke about roughing up protesters and the media, and then I heard him say, I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and not lose any supporters. As a historian of authoritarian regimes, I knew what he was doing. This was deeply familiar to me. This was a trial balloon, a statement made to test the public, political elites, and the press to see how much they would tolerate the idea of extrajudiciality and violence. Authoritarians always tell you what they're going to do to you, and this is part of their politics of threat. Here was Donald Trump telling Americans clearly in January 2016 that he approved of violent methods, methods, could be violent himself, and considered himself above the law. The reactions over the next days, which I monitored carefully, were telling. A few expressions of incredulity, some nervous twittering, and a lot of, that's just Trump being Trump. And I confess that I thought at that point, game over, he will be elected. Because by then it was evident that Trump was following a different playbook, the authoritarian playbook, which most Americans, thanks to our history of democracy, were simply not familiar with. So I decided to put aside my academic writing to educate people about what it would mean if he were elected. Over the past years, I've written more than 60 op-eds, including some that predicted exactly what he'd do during his first year in office. If you know the authoritarian playbook, he fits right into it. This is just so appropriate, these sirens uh, in, the, in the background. I've also given over 80 interviews to familiarize journalists with this frame of analysis and warn the public and decision makers about the dire situation we're in. Character matters in leadership, but especially when authoritarians are in office. Some political scientists talk about personalist regimes because the leader's personality, his obsessions, his quirks, come to have an outsized influence over domestic and foreign policy. Not only do his obsessions sometimes become state policy, think of Hitler and the Jews, or Trump and his wall, but managing his moods comes to take up valuable time and space in the media. And the bad judgment caused by one of his worst character flaws, not wanting to take any criticism, can end up uh, in ruinous situations and catastrophe for the nation, as happened with Mussolini and Hitler in World War II. So Trump is not fit to serve as leader and commander of chief of American democracy, but he is fit, entirely eminently fit, to serve as the leader of an authoritarian state. Unfortunately for us, his impulsiveness, his mix of fragility and hubris, his projection of self-destructive tendencies, his lack of empathy, and uh, Jeffrey Sachs mentioned Puerto Rico, one of the defining images of his presidency will be him offering paper towels to the population of Puerto Rico. And most disturbing, his willingness to do anything, even lead the country into ruin, to save his power and the source of his personal enrichment, map 100%, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, on past authoritarian leaders' characters. So this is why, to close, um, America has become a very interesting laboratory. We have someone of clear strongman tendencies who is governing, in a democracy, and a lot of things that, uh, such as all the uh, back-channeling of his staff and the way he treats his staff, we're coming to know things that often you only hear in people's memoirs or after the leader is gone. And we're able to see the sausage being made, as Kara Swisher said. So we have opportunities, we have valuable knowledge to strike back, and yet uh, we, we haven't been doing it. Uh, so I'll stop there, thank you.
Our next speaker is Dr. Jason Stanley. Uh, my father grew up in an upper class, uh, upper middle class, as, a, as an upper middle class German Jew in the Berlin of the 1930s. The rhetoric he heard about his Jewish identity from political leaders caused a set of traumatic memories that is the soundtrack of my childhood. So I'm going to talk not about nuclear weapons, but about rhetoric and its distinctive dangers. Trump's extreme rhetoric towards minority groups has enabled a worldwide surge in harsh rhetoric. From my own family, I know the mental health consequences on, for example, Muslim children growing up in the US today. But we also know from history that acts of genocide, ethnic cleansing, and terrorism have been preceded by periods in which political and social movements employed just this rhetoric. Famous examples include the Nazi Germany, the Rwandan genocide, ISIS, and the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya, where enemy groups were described as invaders, aliens. In her paper, The Myth of the Black Rapist, the philosopher Angela Davis documents the familiar consequences of such rhetoric for black Americans. Uh, lynching. Power over an individual is an ability to change someone's behavior or thoughts in accord with one's desires. One way to control someone is through force. A much better way to control someone, though, is by changing their, uh, per, their obligations to make them what you want. If you make someone think that what they ought to do is what you want them to do, that's much better than forcing them. Um, but do words really work like that? Do words on their own work like that? The literature on mar marketing teaches us that rhetoric does work like this. Here is one result. Asking people even purely hypothetical questions unconsciously shifts their subsequent behavior, preferences and behaviors in often dramatic ways. In one famous study, subjects were told in advance they would be asked purely hypothetical questions, uh, uh, in this case, about cakes and pastries. They were asked, uh, uh, if, you, if science disco had discovered that pastries and cake were healthy for you, would you eat more? And people said no. Then they walked to another room where there was a cart with salads versus pastries. And those who were asked the hypothetical, out of, out of those who were asked the hypo hypothetical question, 48% chose cake versus the control group where only 25% chose cake. Uh, Karl Rove was George W. Bush Jr.'s campaign manager in the 2000 Republican primary, pitting George Bush against John McCain. Before the Southern California, South Carolina primary, Bush's campaign poll, polled prospective Republican primary voters with the following hypothetical question. Would you be more or less likely to vote for John McCain if you knew he had fathered an illegitimate black child, unquote? Uh, Bush subsequently won. Uh, so, so rhetoric does have these effects. No reason is given in these hypothetical questions. It's just words. But what about hateful rhetoric that, that we hear uh, so much right now? A central way that rhetoric changes perceived obligations is via the recommendation of certain practices. Consider the years leading up to the Rwandan genocide. Tutsis were called cockroaches and snakes. In Rwanda, snakes are public health threats. It is a sign of manhood to kill a dangerous snake, a practice that is carried out with machetes. Calling Tutsis snakes over time had the effect of connecting using machetes to massacre Tutsis to the heroic practice of killing dangerous snakes. Now, Donald Trump, with regularity at rallies, calls immigrants snakes. More recently, including in the aftermath of New Zealand, Trump has been calling immigrants invaders. Calling immigrants invaders has the effect of connecting practices one would employ with invaders to immigrant groups. If one is simultaneously advancing the value system of nationalism, then the kind of practice recommended by using invaders to describe immigrants is violence. The the rhetoric of immigrants as invaders has force because it leads people to view violent practices against immigrants as obligatory, as what they ought to do. When the rhetorical force associated with describing Im immigrants as invaders is augmented with the authority of the presidency, it is an especially significant capacity, including across the world, to shift obligations. Rhetorical power may seem magical. 
However, the power of words is hard to take as seriously as other, uh, that the rhetorical power of words is hard to take as seriously as other varieties of power contributes to its strength as a social force. Rhetorical power changes our attitudes by manipulating us. But manipulation is usually something hidden, where speech is out in the open. Its openness reinforces the normalcy of the practices it recommends. Thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Gar Alperovitz. Thank you. I want to bring some of this incredibly important discussion down to nuclear weapons. And I want to remind you of the new research that we now have on the bombing of Hiroshima, the 75th anniversary of which is next year. And the discussions, I think, will begin at that point. Virtually every military leader in the United States government in power at the time of Hiroshima was opposed to the use of the bomb. They all understood that surrender was already inevitable and that the Japanese were ready to surrender and that th this bomb should not be used. They made an attempt using the Joint Chiefs of Staff, tried to get the British Chiefs of Staff to get Churchill to persuade Truman, and he failed, partly because the John Bolton of that time was the man who controlled the decision. So we not only have a question that's being posed here <clears throat> about the leadership, about the presidency, but we have questions about the structure of power around him. And the loss of James Meade, I think, is a major, major loss in terms of the military's possibility of being a stabilizing force rather than, as some people think, a dangerous force. But let me give you some ideas about every major military leader at the time spoke out publicly, publicly after the war, denouncing the military decision. Most people don't know that. President Eisenhower included. But here's Admiral Leahy, the chief of staff at that time. The use of this barbarous six-star six admiral, there are five, that means you're one ahead of the five stars. The, that is, you, you, they're only a very, very few are made to that level of rank. The use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. Curtis LeMay, the atomic bomb had nothing to do with the end of the war. Eisenhower, the same and same. I could go on and repeat virtually every major military leader. And the reason I bring this forward is not so much because of that time, but to remind people what's at stake. Military, military issues here involve the killing of millions and millions of people, potentially, with thermonuclear weapons. And the issue of John Bolton and the advice and the mix with that with the presidency now I think is a major, major question we need to put straight on the table as we consider the direction we're really, got, we're really talking about. The second piece, I want to bring the same issue back again to concrete, concrete il illustrations of the, what can be done and what will be done. I happen to work in the United States Senate as a, as a policy developer and policy assistant at that time of the Gulf of Tonkin um, resolution, revolution, I'm, I'm sorry, resolution. That was understood at that time that there had been possibly, possibly a minor attack on possibly an American ship, maybe. It was built by the Johnson administration, in many ways a very productive administration domestically, into a great threat, knowing that it was very doubtful that anything had happened. And it gave them authority to go to war, out of which 57,000 Americans died and three million Vietnamese died. That is again what we're talking about. Hiroshima illustrates one piece of the puzzle. That death, the death toll there represents another piece of the puzzle. And then you ask yourself the question of this unstable man and John Bolton as the mix. So I want to sharpen what's at stake. And I think the real question becomes for people like us is whether we can begin, the, the silence is deafening. And that's why opening the discussion here is so important, raising very profound questions about what's at stake at a time of nuclear weapons, a man in the White House who we doubt, and a, and a security advisor who, by all accounts, is a very, very risk-taking man. So I think the issue really is not about Donald Trump. It's about us. It's about whether we find any way ourselves, through writing, through academic work, through political work, through organizing, to educate, and to begin to take seriously what's at stake. 
Congressman Raskin is raising issues about whether we could use the 25th Amendment. That's one way to go. Public, there's a deafening silence in the public about these questions at this depth. So what happens when citizen action begins, community discussions, churches, temples, that kind of university discussion, it is really important to get beyond the quiet, the deafening quiet, that in fact is, is the march, the march, march quietly towards whatever Donald Trump and Mr. Bolton want to do to us. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Scott Ritter. Thank you very much. Just want to say what he said. But, yeah. And I don't mean to be, you know, uh, make light of this subject. I come at it from a, a personal perspective. Um, to reiterate, nuclear weapons were invented by the United States of America for either destruction or intimidation. Either to destroy the Japanese and beat them into submission to surrender, or to intimidate the Russians from invading Japan or moving on Europe. That was their purpose. Destruction, intimidation. Fast forward 1985, I was an intelligence officer in the United States Marine Corps, 5th Battalion, 11th Marines, a direct support battalion, art, uh, artillery battalion, nuclear capable. We'd have exercises. One exercise was whether or not we could properly receive, prepare, and fire a nuclear weapon. The other one was whether in time of war, we as, could invoke the pr appropriate command and control procedures to have nuclear launch. We do major, major exercises, realistic exercises. One was the Russians coming out of Afghanistan through Iran down to the port of uh, Chabahar and Bandar Abbas. The exercise always ended with the Russians breaking through and we firing the nuclear weapon to stop them. Then that was done. I said, what happens next? No, nothing happens next. The world ends. So we knew that was the, what was going to happen, and yet that's the solution we always picked. Fire the nuke, world ends. Later on, when I became a uh, weapons inspector, implementing the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, I worked at a factory in the middle of the Soviet Union, Vodkins. They produced SS-25 intercontinental ballistic missiles. We used to joke about it. Missiles would come out, we'd pop the lid, inspect it. First one that came out, we nicknamed Des Moines. The second one, we nicknamed Pittsburgh. The third one, my colonel looked in and spelled out, and we said, what do you see? He said, C-H-I-C-A-G-O, Chicago. It was a joke. These missiles come out, they're aimed at American cities, except it wasn't a joke, because those missiles were aimed at American cities. One of the things about the INF Treaty, and the reason why I bring this up is that President Trump just exited from the INF Treaty. Come, I believe it's going to be August, we will no longer be a part of the INF Treaty. The INF Treaty, ladies and gentlemen, was the first time the United States and the Soviet Union stopped viewing nuclear weapons as a tool of destruction and intimidation and recognized the futility of the possession of these weapons and they disarmed themselves of these weapons voluntarily through a treaty. And in doing so, we engendered stability in Europe so that the possibility of a ground war between the United States, i.e. NATO, and the Soviet Union, i.e. the Warsaw Pact, would not occur. And there, therefore, there would be no need for someone like me deciding, do I fire the artillery nuclear munition that creates a thermonuclear holocaust? That's what the INF Treaty gave us. This is a big decision, nuclear weapons, whether or not to release them. When John F. Kennedy was president, he was the first president presented with what was called the strategic, or the, the, the SIOP, the SIOP, the Singular Integrated Operation Plan, the Nuclear War Plan. When he finished with his briefing, he walked down and he said, and they call us humanity. Because he realized the utter terror of what he had just been told. That there were no options short of global annihilation left when we decided to nu use nuclear weapons. There's a story about Leonid Brezhnev when he became the uh, general secretary in 1965. Leonid Brezhnev did an exercise. The Soviet military said, we got to teach you how to use the nuke. Came time to push the button and his hand started shaking. And he turned to his general and he said, are you sure this is an exercise? Are you sure this is fake? That if I push this, nothing's going to happen? They said, don't worry, boss. It's okay. Well, he did it. He got physically ill and he never did it again. Mikhail Gorbachev, when given the same opportunity, refused to do it. Why? Because they knew that nuclear weapons 
could never be used. That it is a fallacy of humanity to consider the use of nuclear weapons. Now we fast forward to our current commander in chief, a man who not only got us out of the INF treaty, turned his back on the Iran nuclear agreement, which again prevented the proliferation of nuclear weapons. But he's also the one who fumbled the, the North Korean nuclear deal. Now some people say, well, you're mixing apples and oranges here. I'm not. You see, he had an opportunity in Hanoi to initiate a process that could have led to the denuclearization of North Korea. All he had to do is accept trade-off between the lifting of economic sanctions and the Yongbong nuclear plant. And that would have begun a process of denuclearization. He refused to do so. Now a lot of people say that was a good deal, a bad deal. What you forget is how we got to that point. It wasn't through rational discussion or diplomacy. It was by the commander-in-chief threatening fire and fury which means thermonuclear holocaust. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the point right now where it's not, frankly speaking, about Donald Trump. It's about the President of the United States. Can we trust any single person, whether it is a man or a woman, with the ultimate power to destroy humanity? And I would put forward the premise that we cannot. It is far too important a decision. It's one that can never be made because at the end of the day, nuclear weapons are about destruction and intimidation and presidents are about implementing power decisions that are based upon destruction and intimidation. We need to take nuclear weapons out of the equation, whether it's Donald Trump or anybody. And I'll leave that and talk to you later. Thanks. And our next speaker is Dr. Joseph Rahm. Thank you. Um, when my daughter was three, she started saying blah, blah, blah to me. Uh, but I was OK with her repeating things she heard if she used them correctly. So I asked her if she knew what blah, blah, blah meant. And she paused and said, it's when daddy says something that doesn't matter. Uh, so dang, she did know what it meant. And I've spent the last nine years trying to learn how to say things that matter uh, to my daughter and all our children. I'm not a mental health professional. Uh, I am an expert in the planet's health, however, and the prognosis is certainly alarming. Um, America's founding text says we hold these truths to be self-evident. Our founders believed in truth, in evidence, and in science. It was science and its daughter, technology, that made America great. But today, science tells us we must cut carbon pollution and fossil fuel use sharply in the next decade, or we'll turn this beautiful and bountiful country into a dystopian hellscape. The clean energy technology solutions are here, I can assure you, as a former acting assistant secretary of energy for energy efficiency and renewable energy. But the grand oil party keeps blocking and mocking what needs to be done. So the nation is in the most dangerous state because President Trump and the Trumpublican party, the only science, climate science denying party in the world, reject truth, evidence, and science. Big oil ignited this suicidal assault on truth decades ago, but it is spread like wildfire into a massive viral smokescreen thanks to right-wing media like Fox News and the online Russian Trump bots. Trump himself feeds Twitter with disinformation, but then his own personal attorney called him a con man, and his founding text is a declaration that he is a con man. In his 1987 book, The Art of the Deal, Trump explains he uses both hyperbole and exaggeration to, quote, play to people's fantasies. But to this day, the media treats him as a president who happens to lie rather than a con man who happens to be president. And so they let his tall tales, his fantastical tweets, drive the daily news cycle. How else can you explain why the media has all but ignored the two biggest stories, the two biggest self-evident truths of the day? First, as I discuss in my book, How to Go Viral and Reach Millions, right now, Donald Trump is still colluding with the Russian effort to subvert our democracy by mocking and blocking any serious effort to fight back against Putin's cyber war. 
The media is not only ignoring that war, but they barely cover Trump's war on the climate, a war that is polluting our air, uh, the air our kids breathe, and ruining their future. For the first time ever, a president is trying to con our entire nation into self-destruction. Yet despite wildfires, superstorms, and dire scientific reports, network news coverage of climate change dropped 45% last year, and climate solutions were only in one out of five of those stories. The only reason climate and clean energy and the Green New Deal are making news now is that our sons and our daughters are so desperate that they have taken to the streets protesting, and millennials like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez have used social media to help them go viral. So we are in an epic struggle between two world views, two stories, disinformation, lies, and con jobs on one side versus information, truth, and science on the other, but we are not winning. Climate change is reality, not reality TV. The untold story of America is that we were built on a foundation of science. The Declaration of Independence is, quote, a scientific paper, as one historian wrote. The Declaration's opening is Newtonian. It lays down the law. And that's why Thomas Jefferson explicitly refers to the laws of nature in the first sentence. He was president of the America's oldest scientific society for two decades. The entire time he was vice president and president, he was so nerdy, he wrote a letter pointing out a math error in Newton's Principia. But it was the scientist Benjamin Franklin who made the crucial edit. Jefferson's original phrase, uh, phrase was, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. Franklin, the scientist, crossed out the last three words. Truths like all men are created equal were self-evident. They were true by virtue of reason, and they still are. Finally, beyond just reason lies our moral duty to our children. In a 1789 letter to James Madison, Jefferson asked a key question of internet intergenerational justice. Must later generations, quote, consider the preceding generation as having had a right to eat up the whole soil of the country in the course of a life? The answer was another self-evident truth, quote, everyone will say no, that the soil is the gift of God to the living as much as it had been to the deceased generation. But here we are today, eating up our soil, eating up our fresh water, our fisheries, our forests. We're eating up our livable climate, but have been conned into doing nothing about it. So for my daughter and all our children, in the name of both truth and morality, everyone must say no to Donald Trump and his dangerous con jobs. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Gerald Post. Thank you. One of the remarkable features of the Trump psychopolitical phenomena is the durability of the base. And I think it would be unfortunate to end this conference without having uh, a discussion of the amazing durability of his followership. You cannot speak about Trump's leadership without considering his followership. And even with his impulsive uh, behaviors and extremist language, polls continue to reflect, as much as recently, 48% support. What is this about? The relationship between Trump and his hardline followers represents a charismatic leader-follower relationship whereby aspects of the leader's psychology unlock, like a key, aspects of his followers' psychology. And I expect many of you have had uh, interesting discussions with friends or relatives uh, who voted with, with Trump, uh, with Trump, Trump. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this has damaged, in many cases, I've lost two friends over what I thought were uh, objective dis uh, conversations. Absin Ullman, in studying the uh, uh, Jonestown massacre, note, in times of crisis, individuals regress to a state of delegated omnipotence and demand a leader who will rescue them and take care of them. 
And that, I would assert, is what is happening in contemporary society. While charismatic leader-follower relationships can be a force for human destructiveness, they can also be a force for rather remarkable moments. Uh, and that, that latter is reparative charismatic uh, uh, psychology as, as represented uh, by Martin Luther King, uh, Mohandas Gandhi, uh, there's two examples. But uh, in, in, in this case, uh, the leader is healing the splits within himself as he is mending the splits within society. This is in contrast to destructive charismatic relationships, where it's a force for human destructiveness when the narcissistically wounded leader rages at the world for depriving him of mirroring and enlists his followers in attacking it. Trump has a mirror-hungry leader personality which feeds off of the adoration of his followers in the charismatic leader follower relationship he has with his base. And I, I find it quite remarkable how durable and sustainable uh, that base is. Uh, this results from the injured self whose grandiose facade feeds off of confirming and admiring responses. The individual feels compelled to display himself in order to evoke the uh, of attention of others. However, no matter how much positive attention they receive, uh, they are never satisfied, consistently seeking new audiences. It's this constant need for new and more attention that led the successful businessman, Trump, to continuously seek a prominent uh, celebrity in the 1980s and 90s, and continually seek a prominent celebrity in the uh, and through TV shows, ultimately culminating in his TV reality game show, The Apprentice. However, the attention he received from this show could not satisfy him, causing him to seek a new audience of attention by running for president of the United States. Central to the mirror hungry, and I want to emphasize mirror hungry, respond to me, I want to hear you, shout for me. Uh, is the ability to sense, uh, uh, to convey a sense of grandeur, omnipotence, and strength. Leaders such as Trump, uh, uh, who convey this sense of grandiose omnipotence, are attractive to individuals seeking idealized sources of strength. They're made for each other. By conveying a sense of conviction and certainty to those who are consumed by doubt and uncertainty, this was uh, evident in Trump's support from rural areas and the working class, where Trump's motto to make America great again had a strong resonance. Despite his lack of any concrete policy, his tweets concerning jobs, jobs, jobs had resonated with many of his followers, especially those who are struggling and feel abandoned by the last adm administration. Mirror-hungry charismatic leaders are often draw drawn to large crowds where the roar of admiration becomes music to their ears. It was evident during the election how much Trump thrived on his large rallies, with people shouting his name, something that has continued even to the present. He needs to continue to thrive off of the admiration of his followers as another form of compensation for his insecurity and self-doubt. Important to note, these rallies have been vital for his supporters as well. There's a quality of mutual intoxication I personally find rather frightening watching the rallies close and seeing the crowds and uh, in their uh, guttural uh, uh, enthusiasm, lock her up, lock her up, build the wall build the wall. Uh, Trump continues to use his externalizing rhetoric, attacking any opponents or focusing on the immigrant society, despite calls from fellow Republicans to focus on issues 
like the economy. But it is the rhetoric that draws in his followers who chant, build the wall, build the wall. One can compare, compare this to a, uh, a hypnotist uh, mesmerizing his audience. But the power of the hypnotist ultimately depends upon the eagerness of their subjects to yield to their authority, to cede control of their autonomy, to surrender their will to the hypnotist's authority. There's an obsessive quality to Trump's fixation on the Great Wall, likening it to the uh, shining skyscrapers which bear the Trump brand, and likening it to the Great Wall of China. Perhaps Trump, with his fixation on building a Great Wall across the southern border, seeks to emulate the achievement of Emperor Queen, a, a glory to which Trump apparently aspires, wanting to not merely be president, but desiring to be an empire, an emperor. Uh, he hopes to brand the Great Wall of Trump as he branded the international spread of Trump Towers when he was the king of real estate. And there is something likening uh, his decision style more to that of a king uh, or an emperor uh, than the president and his lack of understanding of what governing is about. He has a tweet in the morning uh, and that becomes policy, which his uh, uh, seniors need to then catch up with. I found really a, a rather worrisome example of this in the decision uh, concerning Syria uh, and leading first to uh, the uh, uh, resignation uh, uh, of, of his, uh, 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 of, of Coulter, uh, and then uh, of, uh, of, of, of Mattis. Uh, and it was uh, quite, quite, quite remarkable, this concept that, that it seems to be, he should, he can have a thought and put it into uh, effect, and anyone who disagrees with this or provides him the constructive criticism he needs uh, can, can be forced, forced out. Um, so the hypnotic pull of the charismatic leader is compelling for the ideal hungry followers. The wounded followers feels incomplete by himself, seeks to attach himself to an ideal other. Thus there's a powerful, almost chemical attraction uh, between the mirror-hungry charismatic leader and the ideal-hungry charismatic followers. And if Trump thrives on the adoring, mirroring response of his followers, he provides for them a sake of completeness. I'm no, by no means uh, implying that all those who, vo who uh, voted for Donald Trump uh, uh, were narcissistically wounded in individuals. But in trying to understand the resilience of his base uh, and the core of his base, his political personality is particularly appealing to wounded individuals seeking an externalizing leadership and that Trump is particularly talented in uh, appearing and appealing to individuals who are seeking heroic rescuers. But temporarily overwhelmed individuals will also respond to heroic rescuers. Consider how the temporarily overwhelmed British people during the Blitz responded to the remarkable charismatic leadership of Winston Churchill. Yet after the war was over, Churchill was cast in the dustbin of history. When Trump assured West Virginia that coal mining would be returning, he was sending a rescuing message to a socioeconomic bloc that was situationally overwhelmed and needed a powerful rescuers. The base will continue to be the core of Trump's support as long as the externalizing rhetoric and solutions he supplies continue to provide solace to his wounded followers. Importantly, the percentage of the ele electorate identified as Republicans in Gallup polls is shrinking. But recently, the uh, uh, to, it, to as low at one point during the, that blip to 28.6%. But the purity of the Trump base 
will continue to provide a solid support, a floor of support for President Trump. Thank you. Our next speaker via Skype is Dr. Philip Zimbardo. Greetings from San Francisco, California. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but I want to present my five minutes a piece about the dangerousness of Donald Trump. Our president has two new distinctions. First, the analog is the worst prison guard in the Stanford prison experiment. And secondly, he is the most extreme, present hedonist creature in the universe. Two quotes that exemplify part of my presentation that will follow are first, Trump's desire for dominance over everyone can be fully realized in his new role as the mean prison guard who rules over all citizens as his imaginary prisoners. And secondly, as an extreme present hedonist, Trump makes important national and international decisions, as you've just heard from the previous speaker, without ever thinking about their future consequences. He also becomes addicted to any activity that is novel and readily accessible, notably Trump's Twitter mania. Supporting, these, uh, supporting evidence for these conclusions are first, Get a little feedback here. First, Trump as dominate, domineering prison guard. I offer an analog between Donald Trump and the worst prison guard in my Stanford prison experiment. That student, who by chance was assigned to play a prison guard, soon internalized that role in the extreme. He reported later that he felt as if he were a puppeteer and the prisoners who were other students were his puppets so that he could make them do anything by pulling their strings. This total dehumanization of others reflects a dictatorial mindset that characterizes much of Trump's treatment of everyone, starting with his personal staff, his appointed team, extending to women, American minorities, immigrants, climate scientists, victims of extreme natural disasters, and all political opponents. Power is Trump's of aphrodisiac. Um, and then I want to add is that um, okay. it is another of his mindless addictions. Virtually everything he has done publicly since becoming president of the United States is part of his addiction. Secondly, and uh, I know we're running out of time very quickly. Trump's previous manifestation of his sexual addiction pale in comparison to his recent Twitter, Twitter over-the-top addiction. In the past two years, he has made more than 5,000 tweets. His tweets are, have been regularly increasing, 6.5 daily in 2017, 8 daily in 2018, and now more than 9 daily in 2019. As he becomes more manic, his Twitter explosion has been as high as 20 tweets in one day and night, but this very past weekend, Trump exploded with 57 tweets in 48 hours, somewhat totally incoherent, as if he were publicly revealing his mentally un, uh, un, uh, revealing his mentally unraveling. Um, many of these tweets reflect his egocentric megalomania with extreme grandiosity, as Trump is, is praising himself as, quote, brilliant, he, I'm a stable genius, and even more self-aggrandizing assertions, such as being able to achieve anything he wants to that no other American president all of history has ever been able to do, and that he deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. As a present hedonist, Trump lives in the moment without any concern for the validity or prior foundation of any of his assertions. Since becoming president, Donald Trump has made over 9,000 lies, false or misleading claims, many of them repeated hundreds of times, and they have been rising exponentially over the past two years. These conclusions are based on my decades of scientific research on the psychology of time perspective. My time perspective inventory is the most reliable and valid measure of individual differences in time perspective. Many researchers, teachers, therapists, and business people around the world are using it. As, as the first president of the International Time Perspective Association, 
I can say again with, without hesitation that Donald Trump is the most extreme present hedonist uh, in the universe. And as such, he is extremely dangerous and unfit to be president. Thank you, Phil Zimardo, San Francisco, California. While we are waiting for Mr. David K. Johnston, uh, we have a special message from Mehdi Hassan of The Intercept. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not, a, as you just heard, I'm not a psychiatrist. Uh, psychologist or mental health professional. I possess no medical qualifications whatsoever to the great disappointment of my Indian parents who always wanted me to be a doctor. But I do report on the world for a living and I can report to you all quite confidently uh, this afternoon that the President of the United States, the so-called leader of the free world, breaking news is not a well man. In fact, when covering Trump, I'm always reminded of the emperor's new clothes. Remember that story? The emperor parades before his subjects in his new clothes, there are no clothes, he's naked. And yet no one dares to say out loud that he's not wearing any clothes, that they don't see any clothes, that he's naked. And it's left to a small child, a young boy, to shout out, but he isn't wearing anything at all. Today, Donald Trump is that emperor, and the political, media, medical elites are his silent subjects. But it isn't his lack of clothes that's the problem. It's his lack of stability, his incomparably reckless, erratic, belligerent, aggressive, amoral behavior. So who among us is willing to be that child, to speak truth to power, to say what's in front of our eyes? All credit to Professor Bandy Lee and her co-authors who stuck their heads out above the parapet to write a book documenting the danger that Trump poses to us all. I mean, we all laugh and we say, oh, Donald Trump's like your mad old racist uncle at Thanksgiving dinner. We laugh, we make that analogy. It's not funny though, because your mad old racist uncle at Thanksgiving dinner isn't the commander in chief of the world's most powerful military, doesn't have access to the nuclear codes, uh, isn't in control of the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, the Secret Service, isn't the de facto leader of one of this country's two major political parties. And yet, in my view, the American Psychiatric Association is out to lunch. It's abdicated its responsibility by hiding behind this outdated, irrelevant Goldwater gag rule. Um, and my colleagues in the media, worried about losing access to the White House, won't point out to their readers and their viewers what they all know to be true, that there has never been a president like Trump. The all caps tweets, the obsession with the election result and with crowd sizes, the constant comparisons with Obama, his complete lack of human empathy, his inability to show any kind of compassion or humanity in times of tragedy, his constant references to himself in the third person, his bragging, his boasting, his childish point scoring, his childlike attention span, his slurring of speech, his rambling incoherent answers to the simplest of questions, his inability to retain new information, to absorb basic facts or figures, his unwillingness to read anything, the delusions, the deep-seated paranoia and insecurity, the angry rants, the ridiculous conspiracy theories, the jumping from fire and fury to love letters to maybe now back to fire and fury again. Ladies and gentlemen, we, and I speak as a journalist, have refused to do our duty. We have averted our gaze for far too long. So when will it end? This past weekend, the president tweeted and retweeted 50 times, 28 times on Sunday alone. He retweeted racists, fascists, white nationalists, conspiracy theorists. Now, I don't know what the medical term for that kind of behavior is, but I'm gonna go right ahead and call it unhinged, unstable, dangerous. And yet, we all move on. It's already gone from the news agenda. We've forgotten the tweets, we moved on to something else. This is a problem, because now is a time to draw a line in the sand and say this behavior has to stop, this coverage has to stop, this is not a normal presidency, and we have to call it out. To borrow a line used by the president who came before this one, if not now, when, if not us, who? Thank you very much for your time.
Our next speaker via Skype is Mr. David K. Johnston. Me this time? Yes. Good. So, um, let's see if you can hear me directly. Okay. So, we'll go back to the dual system here. Well, welcome. I'm sorry we had these technical difficulties. Um, I have studied Donald Trump closely now for almost 31 years, longer than any other journalist, because I find him to be endlessly fascinating, especially because despite his enormous deficits, not the least of which is that in the vernacular, he's crazy, he keeps moving up in the world. And I think we should try and take a multiple, well, excuse me, a multiple disciplinary approach to understanding Donald Trump and his mental deficits. You know, you are more likely to encounter someone who has mental illness than has the flu. And this being our 45th president, at least one was likely to be mentally ill. Now, of course, there is not one mental illness. Like cancer, there are lots of different forms of mental illness. And you've been hearing discussion and will hear more by mental health professionals who specialize in the sciences of the mind. But because I'm an investigative reporter and not a medical doctor and not a psychologist, I favor a slightly different way of looking at the issue that we're considering today. Because I believe we should sift through all of the tools available to us, and we should also be very cautious and skeptical about our own views and conclusions. So the approach I take, which I think any rational, reasonably educated individual can apply, is from the Army Field Manual for selecting which officers will be promoted. Uh, there are six criteria that you can distill from the Army Field Manual on leadership development. Trust, discipline, and self-control judgment, critical thinking, self-awareness, and empathy. Donald Trump failed every one of these tests. For example, on the first one, trust. In his own book, The Art of the Deal, Donald Trump brags about cheating his partners in the construction of his first casino in Atlantic City. And in other books, he brags about his dishonesty. Uh, how about discipline and self-control? It means, the Army says, that you do not react viscerally or angrily to news that is unwelcome. It means you don't let your emotions drive your conduct. Well, clearly Donald Trump fails that test. Then there's judgment. Donald Trump says he has the best advisors in the world. Do you know where he says he gets them? They reside in his own head. Uh, if that's not an example of mental illness, I'm afraid it's beyond any ordinary human being to understand it. How about judgment? Donald says he is the world's greatest expert on 22 subjects. Now, one of those subjects, taxes, is something on which I have something of a reputation. And I can tell you that, uh, as I point out in my biography of Donald, uh, his own words show that he knows nothing of substance about taxes not even how to cheat, which was actually done for him by people he employed to cheat for him. Uh, it's as if I were to tell you right now, you know, you probably don't know this, but I'm the world's greatest expert on airplane design. Aleutian, Antonov, Boeing, McDonnell, they have nothing on me. Uh, oh, uh, what's a wing? <laughs> Critical thinking. Leaders adapt the Army says, to new facts. They change their understanding of the world to conform with the facts, and they work to have the most accurate possible understanding of the facts. They also anticipate the first, second, and third order consequences of their decisions. What does Donald Trump say? We have no choice. Clearly, he failed that test. Self-awareness. Donald lies compulsively. There are videos you can watch, if you don't recall at the moment, where Donald says something and within 90 seconds denies he ever said such a thing. He is completely lacking in self-awareness about what he has said and done. 
And it's crucial to this concept that he has created, this oxymoron of fake news. If it's fake, it's not news. Now, how about empathy? In the mind of Donald Trump, the other does not exist. You and I are merely objects to be used. And consider when he flew twice down to Texas because of Hurricane Harvey. On the first visit at Corpus Christi, he bragged about the size of the crowd that he drew, as if anybody would care. And he was very careful to get nowhere near there were actual damage from the hurricane. And how do we know that? Well, there are photographs of he and Melania getting on the plane to leave, and her brand-new white tennis shoes don't have a single spot of mud. Then he made a second visit. And what did he say to people who lost their homes and whose lives are in disarray, who are at a joint feeding station? Have a good time. There is no empathy, but at least he didn't throw paper towels at them the way he did people in Puerto Rico. You know, there's an old saying in America, uh, rich people are eccentric, poor people are crazy. Uh, Donald Trump fits that to a T. If you sat down on a bus, next to Donald Trump, and starting a conversation with him, had no idea who he was, within an hour you would be saying to yourself, how did I get next to this crazy person? Who is this blowhard nutcase? Now, that brings me to the final point I want to make here. We talk a lot in this country with good reason and around the world about public health, and we tend to think of that in terms of infectious diseases. We don't want to spread diseases we can stop with vaccines, we want to have good public health so people don't die from things as they used to in great numbers in America from cholera. We need to also talk about public mental health. The fact is that tens of millions of Americans, many of them well-educated Americans, believe that Donald Trump is a demigod. Not a demagogue, but a demigod. That should disturb us deeply. It should tell us there's something fundamentally wrong in our society that such serious misjudgments could be made. So as you go through the rest of your talk today, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there, um, I hope that you will be self-critical about what you learn and be careful of confirmation bias, that you think carefully about how we imbue people we see as being powerful with the idea that somehow they're special, or their behavior shouldn't be judged by the same standards we judge everyone else. And to not lose sight of the fact that in the vernacular, Donald's crazy. Thank you. Now, before we move on to the panelist discussion, we have a special word from Honorable Congressman Jamie Raskin. Hello, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come by to say a few words about the 25th Amendment. Um, so my subject is uh, related but slightly different from what everybody else is talking about. Um, the, um, I actually wanted to start by just invoking the memory of a great American that we lost uh, last Thursday, um, the late Senator Birch Bayh. Uh, who died on March 14th. He was uh, the lead sponsor, introducer, and author of the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, as well as the 26th Amendment to the Constitution, which uh, lowered the voting age in federal elections to age 18. And he also was the author of, uh, of Title IX and uh, was involved with uh, me and some other legislators in uh, promoting the National Popular Vote Plan, which is an attempt to get America out of the uh, antiquated and obsolete electoral college system as we have it, which has delivered um, two popular vote losers in the last five elections as President of the United States, both in uh, 2000 and, uh, of course, um, in um, 2016. Um, but um, so Senator Bai, who we lost last week, um, was uh, the great champion of the 25th Amendment, which was added to the Constitution in 1967. He worked closely with Senator Robert F. Kennedy, uh, who 
uh, helped him in moving the 25th Amendment, but it was a, a strong uh, bipartisan effort and it passed overwhelmingly in the House and the Senate with both Democratic and Republican support. The 25th Amendment has uh, four parts to it, and the first three have all been activated and used. The first one simply says that uh, if the presidency is vacant because the president uh, is um, removed from office, if he's impeached and convicted, or if he dies, or if he resigns, uh, the vice president becomes president, which actually was uh, a bit ambiguous before that. It was clear that the vice president would uh, employ the powers of the presidency, but it wasn't exactly clear whether or not the vice president would become the president. And so section one established that the vice president actually becomes the president. Um, section two dealt with a vacancy in the vice presidency. If the vice president leaves, the president nominates a vice president and with uh, majority approval in the House and Senate, it, Senate, that nominee then goes on to become the vice president of the United States. Think about uh, Richard Nixon uh, nominating Gerald Ford after the resignation of Spiro Agnew. Um, so um, that's section two and that has been used. Um, and then section three um, deals with the temporary transfer of power from the president to the vice president um, in the event that the president is unable to successfully discharge the powers and duties of office. And I think of this one as the, the colonoscopy provision of the 25th Amendment because it's been used for a number, uh, in a number of cases of the uh, presidential colonoscopy. Also during President Reagan's colon surgery uh, when Vice President Bush took over, um, but then Bush uh, had a colonoscopy and uh, transferred the powers to Cheney for the, the period until he recovered consciousness and then uh, under the terms of the amendment uh, is able to resume the powers of the presidency just by writing a letter. Okay, so when people talk about the 25th Amendment today, what they're talking about is section four of the 25th Amendment, which has not been used yet. And what it says is that when uh, the vice president and a majority of the cabinet or the vice president and a majority of a body set up by Congress determine that uh, the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of office, then the vice president shall immediately assume the powers and duties of office in the place of the president. Now, it's not the end of the story because the president can then, um, I mean, think of a case where it's, everything is cooperative and um, agreeable, a case where, say, a president uh, loses consciousness and is in a coma, um, and the vice president and a majority of the cabinet or the vice president and a majority of a body set up by Congress say the president cannot uh, successfully pursue the powers and duties of office, and then the president's in a coma, say for two weeks, and then snaps out of it, comes back. At that point, the president can transmit a letter to the president pro tem of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, and say, I'm back, everything's fine, and everything's good. Now, in the case where, um, say a president is um, otherwise waylaid, the president is kidnapped, the president goes missing, or the president has some kind of uh, psychotic break or mental breakdown. You could have the same sequence of events and say the president insists upon his capacity, but the vice president and a majority of this body set up by Congress or a majority of the cabinet disagree. At that point, they've got four days to come together and say, we disagree with the letter that's sent by the president. And at that point, power is restored to the vice president, and then Congress has to meet. And Congress gets together and within 21 days has to decide in the event that there's a contest over whether or not the president has the power to execute the, uh, to successfully execute the duties of office. Um, the Congress has to decide. And it's by a two-thirds vote. In other words, it would require a two-thirds vote to remove the powers from the president and keep the vice president um, acting. If the Congress does not decide by a two-thirds vote in both houses, a concurrent vote, um, that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of office, then he resumes. Okay, so you can see that that's a, it's a fairly intricate system filled with a lot of protections. 
um, the authors of the 25th Amendment did not want this to be some kind of uh, political process, much less a partisan process. They didn't want it to be uh, a substitute for impeachment, and it's more difficult than impeachment in the final analysis because impeachment, of course, requires just a majority vote in the House of Representatives and a two-thirds vote to convict in the Senate. This would, in the final analysis, require a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress. So it's not like this is any kind of a shortcut or end run around the impeachment process, which of course deals with a different question constitutionally. Impeachment deals with the question of whether there are high crimes and misdemeanors, offenses against uh, the Republic uh, for which the president must be removed. Um, and they are the, the language is bribery, treason, or other high crimes and misdemeanors to give you a sense of what the founders had in mind in terms of the kinds of offenses against the republic that justify impeachment. This is a very different problem, and if you look at it in the context of sections one, two, and three, it's about um, a, a real problem of succession that takes place in the presidency in the nuclear age. Because this is passed in 1967, after the assassination of President Kennedy, which was much on the minds of the authors of this, and it's very much part of the legislative history. And a lot of it is about who will have control over nuclear weapons, and we can't afford to have ambiguity and looseness in this process. We need to have clarity about who is in control of the executive branch of government. Um, in uh, my first term in Congress, in the last term, uh, I introduced legislation to set up the body that has never been created for Congress um, to have in the event of a presidential emergency. When I first got elected, uh, I was searching for it. I couldn't find it. I called over to the Library of Congress. I said, where is the body that was set up by Congress? And they called back and they said, the body was never set up by Congress. And that was on the 50th anniversary of the 25th Amendment and of Section 4. The body simply was never set up. Now, you could read it to suggest that the body should only be set up in the midst of an emergency. Obviously, that's not ideal because then it you know, it slows everything down and becomes uh, a part of the controversy. Um, I think it's better uh, read to be a permanent body that Congress sets up that will act alongside the cabinet in the event of a presidential incapacity. So um, we had 65 co-sponsors. Uh, unfortunately, it was all along party lines. It was all Democrats who co-sponsored. But the legislation doesn't mention um, the current president. It doesn't mention any president. It just sets up the body so that it is there to act in the event of a crisis or an emergency. Um, I'm going to be reintroducing this uh, legislation within a week or two. Uh, I hope that we get a lot more than 65 or 70 co-sponsors that we ended up with uh, from the last Congress. I hope we get an overwhelming bipartisan uh, mandate for us to do this. And um, I think that the, the logic of it is compelling. For one thing, we are still very much in uh, the nuclear age, obviously. And, you know, we have had uh, mad kings and deranged executives for many centuries in history. There's an interesting literature I found about the intersection of uh, sociopathy and political leadership, and there's no doubt that sociopaths are often attracted to high office and to political power. But the nuclear age obviously dramatically changes the stakes of what it means to allow someone uh, who is mentally imbalanced to uh, reach the highest levels of government in uh, any country in the world. And so I think that uh, Senator Bai and um, the Congress in 1967 and the states that adopted the 25th Amendment were very wise and prescient um, in their thinking about this. And I think that we've got to vindicate the wisdom of what they did. There's a, an important separation of powers point that also needs to be made. And I think that it is one that is um, illustrated vividly by current events. Um, the 25th Amendment says that the cabinet can act, but the cabinet is obviously in the executive branch of government underneath the thumb of the president. And the framers of the 25th Amendment understood that the cabinet could be cowed or manipulated or intimidated or threatened by the president, especially a president 
who, for various reasons, is not successfully able to discharge the powers and duties of office. And so that's why the framers said, we're going to have two bodies that can act in conjunction with the vice president. One would be the cabinet, and the other is a body set up by Congress for this purpose. In the legislation that I will be uh, reintroducing with my colleagues, we are calling for a 17-member commission that would be made up of eight members who are former um, members of the executive branch of government, former presidents, vice presidents, attorneys general, secretaries of defense, secretary of uh, treasury, surgeon general of the United States, and a few other offices, um, eight of whom would be uh, physicians uh, and psychiatrists, um, and then one, a 17th member, who would be a chair chosen by all of the members of the commission. All of these people would be appointed on a scrupulously bicameral and bipartisan uh, process. So there would be uh, the Democratic and the Republican leaders of the Senate and the House who would be responsible for appointing within these various categories. Um, so, but we, we need it because I think we've already seen the way in which members of the executive branch who have been talking about the 25th Amendment have come under all kinds of intense reprisal and scrutiny. Uh, just, uh, it was either this morning or yesterday I saw an article about, about Senator Lindsey Graham who wants to do an investigation of uh, members of the executive branch in the Department of Justice who talked about the 25th Amendment in the case of the current president. In other words, they want to make it somehow suspicious activity to talk about the 25th Amendment. The whole point of the 25th Amendment is to have members of the cabinet um, engaged in the process of making sure that the president is able to discharge the powers and duties of office. But as each um, returnee from the Trump administration comes back to talk about what's taking place inside, uh, they are all invoking the 25th Amendment. And they say there's lots of talk about the 25th Amendment in different circles. And you can go to each one of the books that's been written. And um, unfortunately, I read most of them. Um, and uh, most of them have people talking about the 25th Amendment. I think what provoked the ire of Senator Graham was uh, the suggestion that um, that Rod Rosenstein had talked about uh, the 25th Amendment and people in the Department of Justice. Well, if you're going to have a crackdown on speech about the 25th Amendment, almost as if it's like talking about climate change, something else you're not allowed to talk about, um, obviously it's not going to work to have the cabinet be the watchdog for the national security when it comes to our 25th Amendment interest. And that's why Congress really does need to set up another body so that it's there and we can break the glass in the event of an emergency. So um, I, I know I've done nothing to uh, illuminate your central subject here today, but at least I wanted to give you some background on the constitutional architecture dealing with this problem and say that there are some people in Congress who are working on this problem and we will be pushing legislation in this Congress. So thanks for inviting me to drop by. Sir. Please join me in thanking our speakers. For the next 15 minutes, there will be a panelist discussion conversation moderated by Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you. Well, I'm utterly uh, <laughs> depressed. Um, what a horrible discussion we just had. Uh, so it's an emergency. It's desperate. I, I would uh, open the floor only for solutions. Seriously. Uh, we didn't hear any solutions. Uh, we just heard uh, anguish. We heard a lot about uh, nuclear threat. We heard a lot about uh, an unhinged president. Uh, but we didn't hear solutions. Uh, and. I think we face an urgent uh, problem, 
And by the way, we're losing politically. Uh, because, uh, as many people pointed out, uh, the following is strong, it's intact, uh, and uh, I just wonder if anyone has anything useful to say about solutions. Please. Jump in with one solution, which is what Congressman, uh, into, into the mics. Congressman Raskin just mentioned. The Constitution provides for a solution. We just need to use it. And indeed, the con Constitution provides for two solutions, the impeachment clause as well as the 25th Amendment. I do want to emphasize, however, that we did without the 25th Amendment for almost the first 200 years of our history, and that many of the concerns that would implicate the 25th Amendment, I believe, are relevant to the impeachment clause of the Constitution the difference between the two and the House of Representatives is that the House of Representatives can, by majority vote, vote out articles of impeachment. And I believe that the members of the House should consider not just the high crimes and misdemeanors that are set forth in the impeachment clause of the Constitution, but interpret that language, uh, which is really quite broad and flexible language, is allowed for the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson simply for uh, sympathizing perhaps too much with the South or for Pres President Clinton for lying under oath about his sexual affairs. Uh, but that is very broad language and I believe that it is relevant, the state of mind of the president who commits high crimes and misdemeanors and if he is psychologically deranged and a threat to the United States, to human civilization, I believe that is relevant, and so that we should not simply look at these two clauses of the Constitution separately as two completely separate issues, but realize that even if uh, uh, the 25th Amendment is almost certainly not going to be used in the case of President Trump, it should be, uh, that a lot of these same mental health considerations are relevant for explaining why the president is engaged in high crimes and misdemeanors, including the obstruction of justice. This is a very dangerous situation, and I again call on the United States House of Representatives to conclude uh, as soon as they can the investigations in the House Judiciary Committee, and if warranted by the evidence, to vote out articles of impeachment against the President of the United States. Can, 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 I, can I raise? Uh, I have probably a slight distinction from others on the panel. Uh, I think that it depends. So there's, there's this question of the solution is a question of the solution to what? Uh, you very often in the history of fascism see fascist leaders described in psychoanalytic terms, for instance, in the work of Wilhelm Reich, in a way that does suggest the behavior we're now seeing. So to me, the problem is the attraction of a certain kind of politics and we need a solution to that attraction. Um, and we need to deal with uh, the kinds of politics that Mr. Post talked about, uh, the masculine, macho, hyper, you know, uh, uh, big daddy politics. Um, I see leaders all around the world who were dictators and fascists described as having mental health problems. There's some connection there. Um, so I would, I would look for solutions in changing the underlying problems that led us to vote this way. I think by solution, I mean uh, that things not uh, turn into a uh, bloody disaster before our eyes. So we know we have a political problem, right. but by solution, uh, I, I mean something, and I think we ought to mean something more than uh, trying to have better politics in our country. Right. Uh, I think the idea is to avoid absolute disaster right now. And this does not seem to be taken very seriously in our political processes. Uh, I don't know why the speaker uh, recently said that uh, she did not think impeachment should even be considered uh, right now. This seems to me to be a rather shocking statement uh, in the midst of uh, over uh, enormous evidence of uh, many crimes uh, having been committed. So 
that is an expression of what I would call normal politics in a completely abnormal circumstance. And so by solutions, I'm uh, looking for ideas about how to uh, avoid disaster right now in, in a setting where this president has a real following uh, and where he is clearly uh, capable of, uh, uh, of uh, causing uh, extraordinary harm. Um, if, if I may, the, this is the most uh, visual and media-oriented president we've ever had. And in the history of propaganda, it's a unique situation because the Fox News, which is like his you know, allied media, state media practically, doesn't just um, parrot the leader as in the past. It's a feedback loop where Trump parrots them. So media portrayals uh, are key. And we need to put way more pressure on the media. Um, the first time I saw on CNN's, you know, Chiron, the authoritarian playbook, enter in, because it was kind of like the A word, and this is part of this denial. Nobody wanted to talk either about his, his mental health problems or about the fact that he resembles, you know, very dangerous people from the past and, and Putin and the present. So the media has been extraordinarily uh, on the defensive and thus ineffectual. Uh, CNN keeps um, booking paid propagandists to lie. And so a lot of the, you know, a lot of the so solution has to come from, from there. We have to have a different framework for depicting uh, Donald Trump as a person and and the structures, what did you say, Gar, the structures of power, the, the kind of disease structures of power around him. So pressure on the media is one way. Yeah, I, I think uh, Mehdi Hassan made a very uh, uh, fine statement, but he did say that uh, we have to stop averting our gaze. This seems to be exactly the opposite. We're doing nothing but staring all the time uh, at this guy. There's no averting the gaze at all. Uh, but we are not uh, doing more than uh, channeling these emotions uh, rather than actually addressing uh, the mass temptations to extreme violence. I'm a, I'm a bit old fashioned on things like this. Um, and I think one of the solutions or one of the things to do is precisely the sort of thing that's starting here. And that is to say, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the civil rights movement, recognized, and the anti-nuclear movement at one point, the need actually to con begin building movements external to just normal politics that focus on this. And so I, I see that process as generating the power base for the kinds of things we need. It does not now exist. So I, I commend the, the, the people who've organized this conference particularly, but it is a possibility. I think more and more people understand something is really wrong here that can be addressed partly politically but partly in a much deeper sense of, of movement building and community by community. So uh, volunteers, <laughs> I'm not volunteering to run that, but I think it's, it's the moment that's, that that might be possible. What would a movement entail? In your well, mind? what you begin to see in the development of the, the movements that I, I'm sure other people know about the feminist movement, civil rights movement, the environmental movements, they begin to show local activity people getting together in living rooms saying, what can we do here to, to get people to sign things, to have discussion groups, to broaden the discussion, saying, this is crazy. We're in real danger. And, and petition signing and marching, it flows into politics, but it is separate from politics because it addresses precisely the kinds of issues being addressed here. That, that's the process that I think is, is conventional almost, but we may be at the time when it's ripening. I know uh, Congressman Raskin has been building movement external to politics in his own district, trying to get people who care about this and see there's a real problem. So that's one thing. There may be many other things to do, but I think this may be the time for broadening what, what's happening just in this room. Scott. I may say. <clears throat> When we speak of Donald Trump, and I, I'll, I'll just say this right up front, I'm probably the only person on this panel, and maybe one of the only person in this room that actually supported him um, for, for office. Um, I say that not because I'm confessing That's anything. probably a good bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the, there, there were reasons uh, for that. But 
the, the reason why I've now turned on him is, uh, is simple, and it's what I spoke of. It's about the survival of humanity. Um, you know, when we speak of solving a problem, I think it's first that we, we, we have to make sure that we define the problem. Because if we don't define the problem properly, what are we solving? We're just speaking, we're, we're, we're doing it, but it, you're not addressing the problem. And when we speak about the problem of Donald Trump, you know, I, I'm not a psychologist, that's, that's for darn sure, uh, but we've, we've heard you know, about malignant narcissism and things of that nature. I will put forward that every person we elect to, to be president of the United States is a narcissist. Um, and almost every politician is, by definition, a narcissist. There are exceptions. Uh, hopefully there's, they're in this room today. But the, uh, the, the point is, most politicians put self before others. It's about being reelected. It's about the power that comes and the prestige that comes with office. Um, that's one of the problems. The other problem is the people that elect them. Donald Trump is a symptom of a larger problem, and that problem is the electorate of the United States that put him in office. Now we come down to, fundamentally, this means that we can put somebody into office who is unqualified to hold that position. His only qualification comes from winning enough votes as opposed to running through a checklist criteria. That might work in normal politics because at the end of the day there becomes debates, discussions, uh, et cetera, and we have the incompetence that is Washington, D.C. played out day by day by day. But that doesn't work when we speak about war, especially when we speak about thermonuclear war. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes down to thermonuclear war today is not Donald Trump, but the Congress of the United States of America, which has abrogated its constitutional responsibilities when it comes to War Powers Acts. The ability with a push of a button to annihilate mankind cannot be put in the hands of any single individual, whether it be a female Democrat or a male Republican. It has to be put in the hands of a collective who can sit back and think over the consequences of that which they are about to do. There is no reason why we should allow any single individual the ability to terminate life as we know it. And to reflect on this, just reflect on the words of Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump's buddy, who in Sochi last year at the Valdai Conference was asked about what would happen if the United States dared act on its current nuclear posture, which is to authorize the preemptive use of nuclear weapons in a non-nuclear event. What would happen if the United States fired a nuclear weapon against a, a Russian target in an effort to escalate to de-escalate? We're going to nuke them so they know we're serious. That's actually our doctrine. What would happen? And Putin said it's quite simple. We would be martyrs. They would be dead. The implication is the world ends as we know it. Because the Russian nuclear doctrine is massive retaliation. One incoming missile, one detonation on Russian soil, and they launch everything against us. This is why we can't have people that think that we can prevail in a nuclear conflict. This is why we cannot give that power to a single individual. This is larger than Donald Trump. This is about America, this is about humanity, this is about survival, and thank goodness we have the occasion brought by Donald Trump to, to bring this up. Yeah, we got a madman in office. That may happen again. It may be a mad woman. But the point is we can't entrust an individual with the future of my children your grandchildren, and the generations that come. It's time that we take the nuclear button out of the hands of an individual, turn it over to a committee who determines that we no longer need nor want that horrible, horrible weapon of mass destruction. Joe. Um, yeah, two things. I, I, uh, I don't view impeachment as a solution because he's got too much support in the Senate. Uh, from his own party, and so it won't change anything. I think the, the solution is going to have to be at the ballot box, and I think everyone here is going to have to uh, up their game, uh, get very actively involved, uh, because uh, the election is going to be a, you know, a very epic struggle. And uh, I, I, the point I wanted to make, though, in terms of a, a solution, um, 
So Trump, you know, was not uh, elected honestly, and that's just the reality. You know, and, and I, the the intervention by the Russians uh, across the board was staggering, and and uh, just read the 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 Mueller indictments of the Internet Research Agency in Russia and the people in the United States. It's it is unbelievable. I it, the the extent to which the Russians have infiltrated social media, uh, and at the same time, the, se the extent to which uh, social media in this country is is inherently corrupted. And uh, you know, I just there's a study that came out yesterday: um, top web publishers by Facebook engagement. Number one by far, Fox News. So, in many respects, Facebook has essentially been taken over by the right wing, in large part because they're very clever. They've been beating up Facebook for years, saying that they were uh, uh, supporting the left wing, because the left wing, of course, is the New York Times and the Washington Post. So instead of having any objectivity on our social media, it has been beaten up to the point where there's balance between the facts and the extreme right wing. And, uh, you know, I think the, the solution, uh, you know, Zuckerberg is not going to solve this problem. Twitter, obviously, has just thrown up their hands and become a total cesspool. So the only possible solution is going to be regulations. The, the Russians still have their, their, their uh, thousands, tens of thousands of bots. Uh, if you know any Russia experts or web experts, ask them what the Russians are doing. If you thought this panel was scary, that is scary. It is staggering at every level, and they do it in every si single country. So uh, it's going to take the point where, where the people of this country, certainly the, the, the people who care about the future of this country, are going to have to step up and say, this is absurd, this is obscene, and, and it has to change. And it's going to have to change in the ballot box, and it's going to have to change with legislation. And it doesn't all have to be federal legislation. A lot of states could put a big dent in what social media is allowed to do the way the Europeans are trying to. So at any level, this has to be taken on. Because if you don't change the structure of social media and, and the, the perversion of it, by uh, foreign forces, particularly the Russians, then this will happen again, and we will get uh, 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 undemocratic elections again and again. I'd like to ask Bambi her view about what to do. Well, the World Mental Health Coalition formed to step in where our own professional associations have failed in leadership. Instead of uh, making a statement on the dangers of our time because of the psychological signs of our president, uh, they have actually instituted a new gag rule by turning what is called the Goldwater Rule, which prohibits diagnosis without examination and consent, into what we are now calling the Trump Rule, which states that we ha cannot mention anything about any objective observable behavior on the part of the president. This should alarm everyone. It prohibits mental health professionals from doing their professional societal duty because our ethical guidelines state that we have a res primary responsibility to patients and to society, not to a public figure, not to guild interests, and not to the reputation of our profession. And many mental health professionals have been up in arms. There are now thousands of us. And uh, the American Psychiatric Association has not moved uh, an inch on its position, despite all the protests and uh, even the uproar among Goldwater Rule scholars. So we are in the process of forming an expert panel by medical criteria alone, which will be non-governmental and apartisan, uh, because it's only based on medical criteria. We would be available to any governmental body, such as the cabinet, Congress, uh, any uh, the vice president, any body that would like to consult with us. We would be available. And we are selecting members, uh, not myself, but we are choosing 
the top members of our field to uh, select panelists based on their credentials, <coughs> not by their political positions. And uh, it is required of our professional uh, standards require that we do not allow political affiliation to play a role in our judgment and we will uh, abide by those norms and standards. Um, and, and this will be, uh, the, the panelists will be revolving uh, every five years and uh, we will be available. Uh, the drafter of the 25th Amendment was concerned that the 25th Amendment was not sensitive enough to cover all the mental health issues. Um, but given enough data, it would be uh, uh, implementation of the 25th Amendment, uh, he said, should be based on the data that are available rather than whether it is implementable. So this expert panel will be available to provide those data. Yes, and our, our last uh, uh, speaker at, at, uh, at this segment will be uh, Dr. Post. I'm uh, impressed by a number of the points that have been raised. I had the honor of serving on the Presidential Commission on the 25th Amendment, and I totally agree with Dr. Lee that uh, there's been some real distortions what was set up in, uh, originally to be uh, an ethical principle has changed into an ethical rule. Uh, and, and there's a profound difference between an ethical principle, which is a guideline, uh, and the current situation where it's thou shalt not. Uh, I believe there are ethical obligations, indeed, with all of these concerns about uh, about mental instability, craziness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I am talking at some risk that my membership in the uh, uh, American the Psychiatric uh, 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 Association uh, will uh, cut, come into, uh, an, into danger, and that's very unfortunate. The first part of the uh, 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 ethical principle uh, says that there's an obligation to contribute psychiatric knowledge uh, 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 to the community. Uh, and then to be told uh, that one uh, cannot uh, 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 do this uh, ethically uh, uh, and that it's, it's unethical to bring your knowledge to the fore uh, it, it has been uh, something that has haunted me throughout my career, indeed, which has been a career in profiling. Uh, I, I, I had a, a, an experience I want to share with you. Um, uh, in two days, a number of years ago, uh, uh, I, 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 I had the honor of being asked to testify twice before Congress uh, concerning the uh, Saddam Hussein crisis. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the next day there was an article in the Times, a profile of the profiler, which spoke about uh, uh, this uh, in positive terms. And I then uh, was honored by the president of the Institute of Peace, who spoke about this being a service of the highest order to the American community. The next day, I was called by a senior official of the uh, 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 American Psychiatric Association, my back waiting to be patted for my great service to, uh, 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 to this, and was told that they had concerns that I violated the canons of ethics. And I said, how on earth was that? Uh, and he said, well, I assume you didn't uh, interview Saddam Hussein and didn't have his permission. Uh, and that was assuredly true. But there is something bizarre about being told you had made a contribution of the highest order uh, uh, to the American community on one day 
and being question, having one's ethics question the next day. This has to be changed, and there is an obligation when there is concern for the stability uh, of the uh, president that the one community which is trained in great detail in looking at uh, the stability of individuals is, is, is muted. Thank you very much. Let me uh, quickly uh, summarize uh, the, the panel. Uh, I uh, will have to leave uh, to go to the UN. Ironically, tomorrow is uh, the International Happiness Day. Uh, so uh, we'll take some uh, cheer from that, but I have to get back to the UN myself. But let me quickly summarize. I think uh, it is the uh, sentiment of all of the speakers that we face a, an emergency from the situation of a mentally unstable president uh, that shows uh, tendencies uh, towards uh, not only grandiosity, uh, but uh, violence as well. Uh, and we heard a number of uh, possible responses, including uh, impeachment proceedings uh, in the House of Representatives. I personally would uh, add that I feel that there's ample uh, evidence for uh, that, uh, even in addition to the psychological uh, evidence. There are clear crimes uh, that uh, uh, are, are, uh, have been uh, revealed in many different ways that are ample grounds for proceeding, in my opinion, with impeachment proceedings. Uh, approach to the media for a different approach to the dangers uh, that we face uh, was recommended. Building a movement on uh, public awareness of uh, this uh, uh, dire situation. Uh, focus on uh, returning uh, Congress to its constitutional responsibility on uh, the sole right to declare war uh, and uh, a return to the War Powers Act. The ballot box in 2020 regulation of uh, systematic uh, disinformation uh, by Russia uh, and others on social media, and support uh, to the uh, mental health professionals, uh, not only not to be gagged, but to speak out to explain the situation, especially as dire and urgent as it is. I think that's not a bad list myself. Uh, it's not uh, a mutually exclusive list. It's many good ideas on uh, how to react to the current situation. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to you. And thank you for convening us. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. And thank you all for us. Um, we will now allow questions from the audience. If you raise your hand, that someone will pass a microphone to you. Uh, please state your name and then your question. Stephen, now it's on. Stephen Hassan. So Robert J. Lifton wrote a book in 1961 called Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism about Chinese communist brainwashing. He outlined eight criteria by which any environment may be judged as a brainwashing environment. And he is my mentor. And there's a body of knowledge about mind control, thought reform, etc. And there's been mention of Russia doing what I've learned is called fourth generation warfare on the United States citizenry. But other than calls for education and movements of people, there really needs to be an education about how the mind works and how it's manipulated. The experts on propaganda know a piece of that. But there seems to be another uh, element that's missing. 
So I, my question is, who, who can help address that? Because I think the answer is mass education in the United States and the world about how mind control brainwashing works and how to de-radicalize people who've been converted. Anybody? Would anyone like to answer that question? I, I would just, I, I don't have a comprehensive answer. Um, one thing that bothers me a lot um, the, is the, uh, the lack of visual literacy in our country and many countries. We're taught to read, but we're not taught, and we're taught to think critically, hopefully, but we're not taught uh, how to look at images critically. And um, the, the first signs, the first things that Donald Trump did to signal to white nationalists, he retweeted images. He's a completely image-oriented president, and he knows how to use images like no one else. Uh, as do the uh, Russians, who have had a hundred years, they were propaganda geniuses because their population was basically illiterate at the beginning of communism, and they invested heavily, as did Italian fascism, in visual. I wrote a book on visual propaganda through film for Italian fascism. And so I'm really worried about um, uh, our um, neglect uh, of this whole issue. And for example, um, no, we don't have to have the hammer and sickle of communism. We don't want the swastika. But liberal democracy has, has never had a kind of punchy, so to speak, um, visual response. And uh, so this is something that I'm personally trying to, uh, I'm trying to teach about and um, shop op-eds around about that this, because this is part of the picture. Well, I just, uh, just a, a quick follow-on. Um, as somebody who apparently was uh, influenced by Russian bots, and um, you know, I, I, you know, obviously um, I'm, I'm not, I'm being very sarcastic here. Um, I think we run a danger of trying to explain away the what really happened. Had an individual spent more time in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, we wouldn't be up here talking today. All right. So this is very much a political problem in the United States. Um, more so than it is a, a factor of uh, the frailty of, um, of an American electorate to succumb to, you know, Russian bots, uh, you know, in their head. I, I traveled the, the United States speaking to uh, white blue collar firefighters in the Midwest as part of my job as a volunteer firefighter. Um, they damn sure didn't pay attention to Russian bots. Uh, they cared about the fact that they felt that they were being abandoned by uh, the Democratic Party that, uh, that they had once supported wholeheartedly. Um, I think that this plays a, 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 a big factor in that, and that we missed the point by focusing on trying to, um, I'm not saying that there isn't a social media problem. I'm not saying there isn't a propaganda problem. I am saying though that um, the roots of the wave of American populism to put Donald Trump in the office are far uh, simpler than you might think. Had an individual spend more time in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, we wouldn't be here today, and that's just a simple fact. All right, I, I'm sorry. I Look, it, Hillary Clinton ran a terrible campaign. Let, let's just say that. Uh, uh, she's a terrible communicator, and, and she did, uh, you know, just, it was just a terrible campaign. But let's be clear what's going on here. So Cambridge Analytica, you know, stole data from Facebook and used that to come up with an analytical approach to depress votes. That was the strategy in the final months of the campaign. And not only that, Brad Parscale, uh, who is now the campaign manager, he was the digital manager before, has publicly said so, right? So they were going after three groups. They were trying to suppress the vote of African-American voters who don't vote a lot, uh, which they did, right? And, and there are ways of doing it. And, and they you know, went after uh, Bernie Sanders voters, millennials, right, who were justifiably angry uh, to, to, uh, uh, and, and the same for, for, uh, uh, for young women. And, you know, the targets are in, you know, they're using psychology. They're using the most sophisticated strategies known to humankind. Uh, you know, Trump himself ran, ran a sharp campaign in the sense that he was running 40 to 50,000 Facebook ads a day. Right? That's all being tested to see what people are clicking on, what people aren't. Now, that's fully legal. The Russians, they have their 40 to 50,000 bots, 
right? And they have a thousand people sitting in St. Petersburg in the Internet Research Agency who do nothing but write angry comments or lies on positive stuff that, that uh, Democrats put out and supportive and viralizing stuff that, that, uh, that Republicans put out. There, there's simply no question about it. And, and tw Twitter's done absolutely nothing about it. The, 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 the study that I cited yesterday, which showed that Facebook had the high, that uh, Fox News had the highest engagement on Facebook, the reason is because Facebook has by far the most angries on face, uh, that, that, that people are clicking on Facebook, eight million. I mean, it's it's astounding. They beat number two, who's Breitbart, by four million. I, I, you know, I've spent a great deal of time studying this. That you know, it's one of the reasons I wrote this book. Um, I have talked to some of the leading experts. Yes, they all bang their head against the wall trying to explain to people how the right wing and the Russians have very effectively used big data and and social media. To, to create an entire alternative universe of news. And I have a lot of people, yes, a great many people voted for Trump sincerely. A lot of the, but where Trump won, if you study the election, is between the people who disliked both Hillary and Trump. And that was one of the most successful uh, psychological warfare campaigns ever run. And I don't want to leave out the fact that one political party is spending all of its effort trying to stop people from voting. Okay, I mean, we have here an entire political party that no longer buys into democracy. And the events of the last 24 months show it, the mere fact that, that they lock, march in lockstep to Donald Trump. So, you know, I, I think there are a great many causative factors for what happened in 2016, but there is no question that the catastrophic failure of social media and the catastrophic failure of the regular media to even have a clue as to what is going on were two of the very biggest, along with the Russians. Just, just a quick add on to that. Hannah Arendt says in Origins of Totalitarianism that a precursor to fascism and totalitarianism is when one part, part, members of one political party start having loyalty to party over parties by which she means they have loyalty to their own political party rather than a multi-party political system. And that's what I think we're seeing now, which. I just want to say, I'm, in, I'm very worried that this is going to happen again in 2020. Very concerned about it. And I think the Russians are going to be back at their same game. But the Democrats, if they want to run successfully against Donald Trump, have to play a lot smarter game. And uh, I'm very worried about what's going on uh, because it's going to be very easy for the far right wing media and Fox News to characterize the Democrats as extreme left. Yeah. And you see three members of the United States House of Representatives featured on Fox News all the time, all three freshmen. Not a single person I'm hearing about who actually won a red seat is being celebrated by any of the major cable channels. We only hear about the people who won blue seats, where beating a Republican is like shooting fish in a barrel. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be for a carbon tax, I am, or for single payer health care, I am. But when it's all rolled into a package and you gotta throw a 70% income tax on it, and you've gotta say everyone's gonna chant for a slogan, it's not going to work. What's gonna happen is that the right wing the Russians, they're going to be able to characterize the Democrats as extremists and as far more extreme than Hillary Clinton. And the notion that the Democrats lost because they went to the center and that they would have won with Bernie Sanders is just patently absurd. Hillary Clinton was a good person. I believe she was an honest person. I didn't buy the attacks. I watched the right wing attack her over 30 years. She had great experience. Uh, and the Democrats are going to make a big mistake. Uh, if they think this is an opportunity to just run to the left because Fox News will celebrate that. I want to hear more on the news about Kamala Harris than about freshman members of the United States House of Representatives who are not running for president because this election is critical and I hope that Democrats and independents and Republicans can get focused and bring this country back to the center where we can have some some agreement on basic principles and the basic threats to our country and yes climate change 
and nuclear weapons and the lack of a, of a good health care system and income inequality. But let's talk about those things in a way that brings everyone on board. It's not young generation versus old and people coming on my Twitter feed telling me it's time for you old farts to move on. No way. Uh, we're all in this together. And it's not about millennials or it's not about this gender or this race or that. We're in it together. We're all Americans. And we need this guy out the door. Next so question. I don't, I don't want to. This, this thread that Joseph, it's a very important thread, so I don't mean to change it, but I am going. Erwin Kula. Um, my mother used to say to me, a blessed, my mother of blessed memory used to say to me, you know, if you're so smart, and the rest I wouldn't say right here, but if we're so smart, and we are so psychologically evolved, and we are so aware, and we've constructed a remarkable us, them, vignette today. And I understand, I mean, as, as someone who does think he's mentally ill, and, and, but I, the us, them route is uh, quite fascinating for mental health professionals to create at this level. I'm curious ar around three things regarding strategy, and, and it probably relates to Gar, Jason, and Gerald more than anybody, but anyone can, can jump in. And that is, how are we, the more evolved, psychologically aware, uh, savvy, how are we complicit in creating the enabling conditions for something that seems to be ac apocalyptic in this room to happen? And that's on the complicit side. The other side of that is, what is the cause of the complacency given the ap apocalyptic nature that we understand is uh, the challenge. And the last, and, and maybe this is for Gerald most, I, what do you think the response would be of the ideal hungry follower to this experience today? So since you, know, since you mentioned my name first. Yeah, and I'm, I'm <laughs> um, I want to sharpen an issue that, 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 that it's, yeah, but it ha you were raising your first point and it's, kind of lingering here, and it was something I was, I've been, I'm involved in a number, another movement that's involved in the economy and built, there's a whole movement going on that folks ought to know about, building the new direction for the economy, and the young people involved, climate change movement, so some that, older some older people too. The, the thing to notice is it's a movement. Now, what does that mean, and what, what does it have to do with what we're talking about? And, and here I want to give, uh, you know, applause to Bandy on, because what it amounts to is what Bandy has done. Which, and the lesson is not to say, hey, great, Bandy, it is great. It is whether, when we talk about they should do this and we ought to do that and the experts should do this and the House of Representatives should do that, I, I'm accord. It leaves out the person sitting in your seat, in my seat. And the question becomes, movement building is about how we actually get involved to change something. So the question specifically becomes, and this is going on in many other arenas, so I find this conversation very important. What is it, looking in the mirror tomorrow morning, I could do to bring people together to do something? Period. How do I call a half a dozen friends and say, let's have coffee, have a meeting at my house, and I would challenge this nonsense and this dangerous nonsense. And that process is very conventional, and it's very American, and it's the only way you build new power. So I, I want to turn the conversation away from our expertise for at least one moment of existential questioning uh, to maybe to the firefighters you see. Uh, and I, I'm seeing this happening, and then you see out of that come meetings and, pe and things to do, and people invent enormously interesting ways to reach out to people they know. And the, that, I, I want to encourage that because there's a big political process going on and all guys like Jamie are beginning to organize, great. And they're big political people, fine. Let's be involved in all that. But you folks have, a lot of folks in here have particular expertise in particular communities that could be organized in powerful ways in exactly the model followed here at this meeting. So I want to encourage that process. Yeah, exactly. It's a process I want to suggest. Because, and the issue is existential. It's about what the person in your seat, or my seat, 
chooses to do, not about, well, isn't that interesting that that's happening out there and what they're doing. So, I just wanted to note not for, a, not a, for the sermon. A, a, a distinction, a theoretical distinction between members of the panel, I'm sure members, members of the audience, for which I was, I was rebuked by Jeffrey Sachs because I don't agree with him. The issue is, is the problem one deranged person or is there a more systematic problem that results in that? So that's an issue that we, d we differ on. Uh, uh, Mr. Post, in his, in his comments, spoke of the supporters, the, rela the, re the relation between the supporters and the person. I really think it's important to look at the history of fascism, because if you look at the history of fascism, you see a lot of the things that we're talking about. If you read Adorno, if you read Arendt, if you read Du Bois, the black American intellectuals who are like, boy, this country is crazy. Look at how we, you know. So you find, for instance, what Gar said repeatedly, again and again. This surprised me. You find Du Bois, Arendt, saying labor, the labor movement is vital when you're fighting fascism. So, you know, uh, I, <laughs> let, let me uh, uh, comment. Uh, I recently reread a book I would encourage to all of you to reread, uh, and that's The True Believer by Eric Hoffer. It, it's a marvelous book, and what he describes in his quest to understand, and this is really what we're laboring with here, to understand how normal people can become involved in extraordinary evil. And he used this phrase that I uh, 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 cherish, uh, uh, that, that the, some of the leaders we are talking about manipulate the slime of discontented selves. I think that's such a powerful uh, phrase. And the question, what do we do with these ideal hungry leaders we, we have to find ways of, of, of confronting that powerful lock where, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the, the, the uh, individual uh, uh, has become part of a, of a movement. And it's very hard when we see this situation where you can't bring up and confront some of these ideas without having your own patriotism or ethics being questioned. And, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a, uh, I, fi I find some of what's happening really quite terrifying. And we must break that connection between this manipulating leader and these ideal hungry uh, uh, followers. Uh, and, uh, and that's very difficult to do. Um, I just wanted to, to add, um, which takes off on all of these things and also what, what Richard Painter said. Um, one of the most, if you look back in history, uh, almost every time that an authoritarian was able to triumph, and this includes also Chile and the military coup, they, there were forces uh, working very hard toward extreme polarization. And one of the, this is the dynamic that has been going on for a while, and prediction, which is not so hard to do, is gonna be an enormous uh, uh, coalescence of energies to uh, d depict, um, there is no, already there's not much of mention of liberals anymore in certain right-wing press, everything's the left. Mm -hmm. right. And again, the few socialists are gonna become, we're all socialists, there's, so there's no more center. And what happens in this crisis style of thinking, which is what, what and also Gerald Post was talking about, these strongman figures, they need to have extreme polarization, extreme uncertainty and crisis, and a sense that there are no other options. The center is closed off. There's only the extremes. So, so, so this, is, this has been happening, and, and the midterm elections, because they are a total affront and a rebuke, a slap to Donald Trump, gender-wise, um, every, every way-wise. And so, so there's a regrouping that's going on because what, what we're seeing is the result of, of long-term powerful forces funded by the Kochs to have a kind of conservative uh, cultural revolution and they're doing it in the schools and the universities. It's a very big, um, well-funded, 
cultural revolution that they, morals revolution, and that's where the evangelicals come in. But look, we, it's very important to have these movements, like Gar was saying, because the, the impetus to polarization and crisis thinking, and this is where two days ago, three days ago, Trump started talking like someone fomenting a military coup. He says, I have the bikers, I have the military. And I, I mentioned, I was very alarmed, and people were like, no, you're being an alarmist. It's, it's nothing. It, it, it's something. Because it's not because he's going to have a military coup, because he doesn't probably have the military, in fact. We don't know. He got his parade, but it doesn't mean he's going to there for him. But it's, it's a violence talk. And the purpose of the violence talk is to make people feel afraid. And then they will be more likely to have the big man restore order. So th this is very, very serious. It picks up, and the, and the Russians, the, what Joseph was talking about, it's all of a piece. And this is the big plan. If we, we, we didn't really ask, what's the end game here? And I'm always thinking, what is the end game? There is not just one end game. But what is Trump's end game? Right? It's to keep himself in power. And, and this is why there's these rumors of now Donald Trump Jr. will run in 2024. You must have a dynasty to keep the exploitation going. But the polarization is key to the kind of um, the, the medium term end game. Just a Goebbels quote to add support to Ruth's brilliant analysis. Goebbels said, uh, the ordinary middle class bourgeois German citizen will not vote for us unless we paint the social democrats as Marxists out for their property. Let me just add one thing here as a, as a military officer, former military officer. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, Trump doesn't have the military. Okay. Exactly. The, the commissioned officer class of the United States Marine Corps, the commissioned officer class of the United States Army, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. Yeah. And that's an oath they are willing to die for, and they've proven that over and over and over again. Even if they politically support Donald Trump, if he ever asked them to violate that Constitution and turn on the American people, he would be terminated that quick. I can say that with absolute certainty. Yeah, no, let, me, let me add to that. that is, uh, it, it's a really important because there are probably some political people, liberals in this room, or left. That is really an important thing that he just said. That the military is not is a top military commission officers, in my experience, and that's another discussion, are fed up with this guy, and they're not going to violate their oath. Yeah, never will. Very important. Next question. Please. Same thing as during World War II, as I was talking about. The top military were against the use of the, mil of the atomic bomb. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Terrific panel. Diane Perlman. I'm a clinical and political psychologist. And um, I started working with Lifton um, in the late 90s oh, okay. on the, um, and also Lifton and Falk wrote a book on uh, indefensible weapons, on psychology, the arms race. And I've been involved in the nuclear issue since 1981, and just a brief announcement, if anyone, um, I'm organizing three delegations to the United Nations of Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review, um, April 29th to May 10th, Psychologists for Social Responsibility, Mediators Beyond Borders, and Transcend International. So if you want to come as an NGO, um, talk to me. Um, and also in 2002, before the invasion of Iraq, I was trying to warn people and organize a emergency warning press conference with Phil Zimbardo, which didn't happen. So, um, so anyway, um, I want to be solution-oriented. I'm writing a chapter uh, for a book on uh, the psychology of people who love Trump. And the, the main issue um, that I'm focusing on is humiliation. It's also envy and humiliation. Mm -hmm. Also, Trump has ADD and probably a lot of his followers do, which is another reason for more visual um, approach. So, um, and Trump makes them feel good. And a lot of the, Hillary made them feel terrible. So um, one thing is that we need to have empathy and try to understand the people and the appeal that Trump has. And you know, one idea is that we need probably one or more transitional objects for someone that they can transfer their attachment to who has a non, -to who can reach them and touch them in a way that's not toxic and hold their hand sort of and say, like, don't be a sucker, or I understand the appeal. So we need, I have some ideas of who some of those could be and need to cultivate them. Another thing is we need to get more um, uh, Democrats independents. I think we need to create more independence, like a declaration of independence, like to get postpartisan and out of the two-party system, but to get more people on Fox News 
So now um, two candidates, Andrew Yang, had a very positive interview with um, Tucker Carlson, and I heard that Pete Buttigieg was on Fox. It's too bad that the Democrats declined the um, offer to have the debate. And um, one fantasy that I have is that, you know, maybe some people could get together with the executives from like Fox and then an MSNBC and say, we have an emergency and we need to do more healing and are there things we can do that can still keep your ratings up, um, but can, you know, to quell some of the things. But, um, and I agree with a comment about education and we need also, also visual, that a lot of the people who love, who Trump appeals to are poorly educated, low information, Many of them didn't um, live in the same neighborhood where they grew up, so they don't have like worldliness and dignity. Um, but so there, we need to keep them in mind and have empathy and find healthy, non-toxic ways to reach them and to appeal to them. Okay. Uh, any quick? Uh, just a couple. I just quick quickly ones. say, point point out that uh, black women voted by large, the largest group against Trump, and. Their, level, their levels of formal education are not necessarily. Uh, so I don't know if that education. White, white, yeah. The thing I'm going to do is implore you not to uh, generalize about the people who voted for Trump. Uh, people do feel humiliated when uh, you have a growing wage gap and manufacturing jobs are going away in many parts of the country. Many people are not racist, despite what we are being told. And I think that that uh, message is the wrong one to say, well, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan are just full of racists, and we want to ignore those people or look down on them, humiliate them more, and think we can just turn out uh, more voters on the left wing of the political spectrum. Uh, that word humiliation is a large part of it. That's what dictators thrive on. People have been humiliated. We made the tragic mistake after World War I of allowing our allies to humiliate the losers. Uh, and uh, Hitler thrived on that humiliation. Uh, and that's not what we should do. We should reach out to everybody. This is about bringing America together, not about us versus them. Well, we are educated, and oh, they just are stupid and racist, and they're the past. No way. We're all in this together. I, I don't think that pointing out and confronting our history and present of racism is humiliating people. It's necessary in a democracy to have a real glimpse and confrontation with reality. I've lived in Germany for years. Is it humiliation that we had to learn about my, my family's persecution in Germany? Germany is the healthiest liberal democracy in the world. So we, we differ on some issues. Although, but I would look, want to look at my own races and that of those of us who are the well educated, absolutely, the wealthy, absolutely. before getting up on the high horse right. and looking at the unemployed person in Pittsburgh or in right. Ohio. Where it's linked with class. I ought to look at myself first right. before I cast a stone on someone else in a fellow American. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. I have a question about uh, overcoming extremism. You point out the, the contrast. I'm, uh, I'm Tim Eastman, a physicist and also philosopher. And in, in both those areas, uh, there are many occasions, occasions of having a dyadic form of an issue, but there's always some triad. There's always some uh, third perspective, an alternate perspective of whatever issue or of whatever problem one faces. Uh, so then these extremes in part tends to come out of starting with a, a dyad, a, a left versus right, and then, and then further polarizing that. And this seems to be repeated in the press and other venues of how any distinction seems to be exaggerated by the media and so forth. So my question is, how can we help to begin encouraging people to think critically about this tendency for us versus them? Uh, left versus right and so forth, and to help people open up to alternate framings of understanding that can, that can transcend such, such simple dualities of thinking and get beyond dualistic thinking. Let me just, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not a psychologist. Um, <laughs> I've said that over and over again. But before we could have an internal discussion in the United States 
about us versus them, left versus right, Republican versus Democratic, conservative versus liberal. I think America needs to have a conversation with the world about American exceptionalism, American unilateralism, because that's an issue that transcends politics. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you find me a candidate right now, other than perhaps Tulsa Gabbard, who's willing to stand up there and say anything other than, we are the supreme power. We rule the world, it's us versus them. That's how America interacts with the world. That's how our children are trained from the very beginning about the supremacy of the American being. And then you expect us to have an interior dialogue that's responsible about us versus them, left versus right. It isn't gonna happen. We have to cure the problem, which is we are not thinking right in the head as Americans. We have to realize that we are but one small part of a grand scheme of humanity. Once we accept that, maybe we can sit down with each other and have a civil dialogue. But until then, it will always be us versus them, left versus right. I, I, let me just say something. I totally agree with what you just said, and I write about that all. But the question is, who is the we? And that I want to drive a, a hard do this because that's where we have to edge it out and people finding ways to actually speak to the, themselves to their friends to their colleagues in different ways and taking responsibility for that so the, that's the edge that I, that I want to put on that because otherwise it's about somebody out there ought to somebody ought to which I agree with <laughs> lots of somebody's ought to I want to say that I do want to say one thing about I, I am not a, a great optimist but uh, I'm a historian so, you know, there's a lot you find wrong. But I do want to give one moment of, of optimism about, about the importance of what can be done by individuals in movement building and, and politics and getting involved, just getting involved. So I'm, I'm a little older than I look like, and I'm from Wisconsin. And I can remember Joe McCarthy. And uh, Joe McCarthy was a vicious man. They shared, you know, the current man shared Rod, the Roy Cohen, Joe McCarthy's lawyer and the assistant and, and the, t the man who taught Donald Trump how to do what he's doing. So, and in the night, it, Joe, Joe McCarthy shot everything that moved politically, anything that moved. Teachers were scared, doctors were scared, nobody moved. And I'm from Wisconsin, that's where he was. So if you had asked people in the period when Joe McCarthy was very intense, could anything be done to stop this guy? I mean, it was, people were frightened to, to death. And of course, People didn't know what to do. They tried to do little things and didn't have any sense of what was happening at a different level. And then out of nowhere exploded the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the fem feminist movement, the environmental movement. Something was boiling underneath the surface in terms, and it wasn't political yet. It became political later, it was movement building. That began to b build up and develop. And that's why, again, I want to really commend uh, Bandy for taking the personal initiative to, to actually make this stuff happen. With, that's why we're here. And I want to again encourage, I think the bottom line is, are we actually willing to do anything or do we want to listen and talk about it kind of to our friends? So bottom line, let's do it. <laughs> Any last comments? There's a comment from the audience. Microphone. You can have this one. Well, thank you all. You've been just um, enor enormously illuminating. Many of you have spoken about the incredible power of social media and, and its uses to abuse us uh, all. I would just like to add to uh, what Gar and I think what uh, Ruth has talked about movements. Um, nobody knows social media better than millennials. You know, they, they, they really know it. And they've proven it, uh, as some of you have mentioned, um, really pro pro promoting the movement against, for climate change <coughs> attention. Also against gun, for, for gun control. I've worked with those students at, at Parkland and they are extraordinary. And, and you can't blame them for partisanship, because they haven't gotten that far. They're really talking about survival. Um, so I just want to love to hear any of you opine on how we can bring them into the movement, because this particular 
issue has not really excited them. Have, have any of you seen any hope of that? Well, um, I, I wanted to say something about education uh, and not specific, so, which I think is connected to drawing people into social movements. Um, so, so this is to connect some of the themes we've been discussing. So Richard talked about humiliation and humiliation as being a force in the rise of fascism. Uh, I think one thing, uh, one thing you find is the, the weird educations people get allows people to create these myths about that enable uh, uh, exceptionalism. So I, you know, at the end of, of Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, he attacks the decision explicitly made by academic historians to teach history to make sure that no one in the South gets angry and to sort of like paper over what happened. Uh, and we still are living with the repercussions of that failure to deal with history. I think we should have a movement to, to I mean, to teach history. I just think actual history of countries is so important. Sorry, I was on a little bit of a topic. But. Now, I would like yeah, to ask if go. Dr. Post, uh, my co-organizer of this conference, if he has any last word. Do you, do you have any last comments? Well, I just want to remind you all, we're not just talking about a leader, we're talking about followers and the social psychology uh, of, of, of the current situation is, 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 is deplorable where there is almost a requirement to not think. Uh, and and the, the unthinking loyalty, uh, I'll, 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 I'll end, end my comment with uh, something I, I thought would be constructive. I had the idea for a book project which would be called Trump versus Trump, dueling psychologists uh, or dueling psychological <laughs> explanations. And I, I found uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a, a friend of some 25, 30 years, uh, uh, agree to do this with me. Uh, and then, uh, and we were each commenting from different perspectives, having a number of different uh, 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 chapters. Uh, and then he became angry when I said something which had a negative connotation about Trump. And, and, and after seven months of labor, wrote me a, uh, an email, I withdraw from the project. And then to my great side, I wrote him, you know, I, I value our friendship more than this project. Uh, and uh, I, would, I would hate to ha see this damage our friendship. And he said to me in a one line uh, uh, email, which I'll never forget, uh, I, uh, uh, in terms of our relationship, Jerry, I'm exhausted. And I then, after great searching, found another uh, a psychoanalyst who had voted for uh, 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 for uh, Trump, uh, and we had fun, kind of dueling uh, psychologists, uh, uh, and then I got the same email from him, and, and this really profoundly saddened me, uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, I am because I, I see this as symptomatic of what's happening in America in some ways. And, and we have to have that be, the ability to dialogue uh, over these political uh, uh, differences or, or, or we're lost. OK, uh, thank you. I just wanted to mention that Dr. Robert J. Lifton, who wrote the foreword to our first edition of the book, um, has mentioned that thought reform happens through informational milieu control. So the purpose of this conference was to bring together voices that had been gagged, ignored, expertise that could bring clarity and power to the people. And the people have more power than they realize that they can lean on their elected officials to act upon the situation, to address this problem, that they do not have to accept it as it is. And for this, I would like to thank you all for joining us today and thank our speakers. And uh, 
First of all, uh, please join me in thanking our speakers. And for the next hour in the same ballroom, we can all meet each other informally, uh, including the panelists who are going to mingle among all of you in the audience. Members of the press can do interviews of the panelists or authors of The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump in the side room uh, on that side. Uh, outside the ballroom where there was previously coffee, there are now soft drinks and hors d'oeuvres will be passed. I thank all our experts and thank you very much for coming to our conference on this critical issue at this critical time. <laughs>